Video game consoles, on average, last about seven years. My casual Friday shirt lasted about one year. That's unrelated. Most people assume I'm just a Nintendo guy, like Nintendo consoles just buy Nintendo games. And that is partially true. I did buy that one tennis game everyone overhyped. But what most people don't know is that my first ever console was the original Xbox. The console I started loving gaming on was the 360. And what would turn out to be the most important console in my gaming journey is, was, the Xbox One. This is gonna be another long introspective one, so if you're here to see me review or shit on something, uh, Sonic 06 is a bad game. People always say, oh, it's rushed out and it's got glitches, but without the glitches, no. Even if it like ran perfectly, it would still be a terrible game. All right, there, there's hot take. Hit my quota. I don't know when I got the first Xbox. The date on the console says 2001. I was a baby at that time, so it's probably not that. The games I had were all Star Wars prequels, Cars, SpongeBob, and Shrek 2. So I'd like to say 2005, 2006 maybe. Meaning I was potentially four years old. How did my parents think I was gonna turn out? I love this chunky little thing. The console wars were still very much a thing, but I just played multi-platform, so it didn't matter. I would play Lego Star Wars on my Xbox, and then go over to my friend's house down the street and play Lego Star Wars on his PS2, and then we would drive over to our other friend's house and play it on his GameCube. I picked the worst one. I also didn't understand the concept of ripoff controllers. Prior to getting the Wii in 2009, I had only ever used Mad Cat's controllers, and I thought that just what Xbox controllers were. That didn't stop me at the Wii, though. Look at this normal controller. Like, I know I'm a small guy, but it's almost the size of my head. I played a lot of games, and by a lot, I mean these eight games, a majority of which is LEGO games. I was very high on these LEGO games, and I was chomping at the bit to play the next installment. And then I saw the trailer. From the award-winning creators of LEGO Star Wars. Play through all three classic Indiana Jones films in one ultimate game. Play as the legendary action hero in Lego Indiana Jones, the video game. Adventure. Bricks New Ground. What? 2008, probably. It's impossible to tell because I can't remember. I got this sleek, white, big, white. Wait a minute, did you just say white? I'm getting ahead of myself. At launch, the only game I had was LEGO Indiana Jones, and that's not hyperbole, but the console came with a bunch of demos. I played the first level of Cloning Clyde hundreds of times, and still, to this day, I don't know about the game after that. Also, Peggle sometimes. How did you enjoy this console with only one game? Good question. See, in the far-off world of the past, they used to do this thing, crazy, um, where, where there were games on a previous console, if you would buy the next console, you could play those old games on the new console. It's a shame they don't do it anymore. So really, I had a ton of games. Eventually, I had a lot of 360 games. And by a lot, I mean Lego, Skylanders, Wrestling, Sonic, and Wally. -E. Okay, that's an oversimplification. Jumping back a little bit, when I went over to the PS2 friend's house, we played the basics. Oh, hockey game? Not really my speed. Star Wars shooter? I love Star Wars, not so much the shooting parts. Then he leaned over to me. And he said, hey, you ever play this game? You could fight in a cage and make people bleed and set yourself on fire and you could play as Jeff Hardy. My little ass sat in awe, just waiting as he loaded up the game and I heard, look at me, I'm a dead man walking, stuff another one in the coffin. It's all we ever played. I saw this big fucker named Mark Henry and I'm like, that guy rules and I was right. Now it's time for the main event. I'm gonna show my best friend Squidward to everyone in town wearing a salmon suit. This event, ruined my life. Here's a picture of me wearing the Intercontinental Championship in my prom pictures. The picture of me meeting Rusev, picture of me meeting Bo Dallas, picture of me meeting Rhino, picture of me meeting Tozawa. It's dawned on me that every wrestler I take a picture with gets fired. Use a picture of me and Sami Zayn. Once we were in the 360 era, it was over. Man, I was a wrestling fan. The thing is, <laughs> I don't think I knew it was real. Like, I played the video game all the time, but I never watched it, so my active theory is that Kid Me 
was just like, well, there's no way people would do this for real. And I just thought it was a video game. I started with SVR, that stands for SmackDown vs. Raw, 2009, and didn't start watching until 2011. I normally fit into a very specific type of terminally online person, as a lot of people in my generation. I oftentimes get asked if I ever made like an OC for a cartoon I really like. My arm's like, it's like a 3D movie, I'm coming right at you. And my answer is no. I'm not one of those weird kids who made OCs and, and shipped characters. It was like, oh, put me in the, sh no, that's cringe. But I definitely made a wrestler, gave him custom lore, had him beat The Undertaker at WrestleMania, uh, be friends with CM Punk, and then own custom entrance song, which I sang myself. This is my OC Tropical. This is his son, Silver. They don't like each other. This is when he became a robot. So no, I was not a normal kid. Thanks for asking. Sometimes you're only exposed to internet armchair critics who, <laughs> who are very obsessed with this idea of the objective truth. And then you become an adult and you stop caring about liking the things you like. In SVR09, I made a stable of Mark Henry, Big Show, Kane, The Great Khali, and Big Daddy V because I like the big boys. And then as a teenager, I was like, oh, the Big Show can't wrestle. Why is he even here? Nakamura should be the champion. And now that I'm an adult, I just want to see Big Show and Shaq slap each other a bunch. That's all I care about. I also had a stable of CM Punk. Kofi Kingston and Edge called Jamaican Me Crazy. Jamaican Me Crazy, Kofi! I continued to play more Lego games up until Lego Batman. I kind of fell off during Harry Potter because, you know, it's Harry Potter. And I had more wrestling games to play. I had this whole running storyline. Every time a new game came out, I would update it. So this, this lore I built went for like five years and it was all I played. I put so much time into it, like every hour of the day and every, I made a bunch of characters. There was an overarching storyline. They all had their own unique lore, likes, interest, at shows, entrances. I made it all, you know, it had been building up for five years. I had so many storylines and stables saved onto these games. And then, and I remember this vividly, in the cutscene maker, I was hovering over Wade Barrett and then, <laughs> That's a crash noise. What the hell is this? I didn't know about the red ring of death. I thought it was just me. I tried everything to fix this, all the weird online tutorials. I littered my system with Q-tips, put a towel over it. It actually worked way better than you would think, but it eventually gave out. After a lot of inner soul searching and mourning over my lost brother, I eventually went out and bought the black one. People have spoken to death about this, so I'll keep it brief, but oh my God, this is so dumb. Every single white Xbox was shipped out with the knowledge that eventually, very soon, it will poop itself and stop working. How did this console win the wars? Oh wait, no, I know why. But first, speaking of ruining my life. Whoa, you could put figures on the portal and they appear in the game? <laughs> All right, which character do you want to be? You can't be Terrafin, all right? I'm Terrafin. Well, now I gotta put this away. I'm glad I did this for uh, one bit. If I had to describe Kid Me as anything, it would be a collector. I made it my mission to get every single McDonald's toy when the new ones came out. I don't think I had normal toys. Not a lot has changed though. My room was caked in webkins, wall to wall fluff. It probably stunk too. And then, these guys. I don't know how I stumbled across these fuckers, but I sure did buy five games and hundreds of figures. This was the first turning point in my gaming career where overnight, miraculously, me and my friends didn't like the same games anymore. Childhood friends outside of school, I just kind of stopped talking to because they liked lacrosse now and not Mario. Some friends got a couple figures, but you know, not wasted as much money as I did. And then they moved on. The new Call of Duty was coming out. It's all the same company, now also owned by Xbox. A couple years later, I bought a Wii U and I was the only kid in a hundred mile radius with a Wii U. Suffice it to say, I logged a lot of hours into that Xbox, but it was some pretty different games. And by different games, I mean different from my friends. All the games I played were pretty nearly identical. Like the wrestling games, I'm over it. I'm moving on. I'm trying to interlock this story and the Adult Swim one to leave little clues about my past for you guys to figure out. After me and the neighbor kids kind of drifted apart, I became close with Max and his brother. That's not gonna make any sense if you didn't watch that video. In the final stages of the 360, I would go over to their house and play Skate 3 like all night. Like that's actually all we played. We put in Wally 360 as a meme and we played the first time. We're like, oh, okay. And then they're like, 
put it in again though. We started unironically like enjoying it. Like it's way better than you would think it would be. And then there, my memory's failing me. What was it? Um, some kind of block game? Let's look at all of our plots here. I had a group of childhood friends who didn't really play the same games as anymore. I lost all my Xbox data, so I was kind of getting bored of trying to get it all back. My new friends needed a new game for us to all play together. And Xbox has an online service I never thought I needed. It's good to play together. I mean, I've played DS games with people across the room from me, but playing a console game, why wouldn't I just go to their house? And then, and then. I knew about Minecraft. I watched the excommunicated. I played it on my iPod Touch and griefed my sisters pretending I was Hero Brian. But coming to console, the closest version to PC? What is a nether reactor? In one foul swoop, I got Minecraft, I got a shitty headset, and I got Xbox Live. In Christian beliefs, you go to confirmation around your teens to get granted a new name. In gamer beliefs, you go on Xbox Live and you randomize the name creator to get your new name. I don't know what I was online before this, but as of that day, I was Khaki Chief 89 from then on out. Except for when I changed it. I would rush home from school, run all the way upstairs, turn on the Xbox, put on my headset, and jump in a party. I didn't care what game people were playing, I just really did not want to miss out. But I didn't have to miss out. Did my friends have Call of Duty Zombies tournaments and it was like gym class where I would get picked last and everyone would groan when I was on their team because I couldn't aim? Yes. But we still got to play the block game, so ha. Huh? It brought us all together. My childhood friends were all back together, and my new cool friends were also there. My longer childhood friend, like legitimately baby childhood, Logan, was also there. Big fans of the channel will recognize Logan, uh, the one without the G at the end of the name. We've been friends since before we were born, because our moms were friends before we were born, and they lived together, and it was great. And then we moved to stinky York, PA. P-U. <laughs> and prior to this, we would just see each other once or twice a year and really cherish that one week. But now, because of the internet, I could play with him whenever I wanted. Let it be known the only other person that cares as much about Skylanders, or cared, I guess, was Logan. The thing is, when you're a kid with minimal internet presence, and by minimal I mean zero, who whose only hobby is watching TV, you only really make friends at school. Me and Logan were tight, but we also had two separate friend groups, if only we could, like, mash them together. That looks so stupid. I introduced Logan to my group of school charms, and it went pretty well. They still remember him, you know, all the good times we had playing. I did the same thing with the boys, the friend group I didn't meet until high school. I mean, you've seen them on the channel, so it worked. Even before they met other Logan, we had another Logan in the friend group, and I'm like, nope, you're Logang now forever, because there's another Logan who none of you have met. That's actually a huge dick move. But what about the other side? I haven't really talked about it, considering it's such a huge part of my life and gaming history. I've talked about my childhood a bunch, and obviously you've met the boys, but I never really talked about my gamer group. That sounds so lame. The group is a terrible name, but it's far too late to change it. The group is a group of 12 Xbox gamers, 10 of which I have no contact with whatsoever anymore, and that statistic is a little off anyway because I'm one of the 12. Through Logan, I met a big group of gamer friends, and we all had a lot of fun on Xbox Live on the Xbox 360. It's not what this one is. I was also very new to the concept of digital games. I had only ever used discs or cartridges. And because of the group and the Xbox Live Arcade, immaculate by the way, it doesn't seem like a big deal now, but the Xbox Live Arcade was one of the few digital stores where like indie devs could put their game to get them on console. We used to play Minecraft, Battle Block, Castle Crashers. I know there weren't 12 of us yet, I think there had to be at least like seven because we all played Castle Crashers and all had different progress on each of our games. But the cool thing was you could use your stats and transfer them over to play your character on someone else's save. So we had to make sure that all of us all beat the game on our own consoles and we did it as a group. It wasn't a big Minecraft server, but Logan and I did have a shared Minecraft world we called the Man Cave World but because it was in a cave. We had a doorbell out in the open. That was the first time I heard the Jeff the Killer story around a campfire. We had occasional visitors, but it was really just for us too. All was going great. We were all a big community, all being able to play the same games and play them online with each other. Of course, if you were a PS3 kid, it wasn't great because then you were left out, but at least you had 
PS Home. It is weird to say now, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but like everyone in my high school got an Xbox One and there were very few PS4 players when for like everywhere else in the world, it's the exact opposite. We were all on the same console playing the same game until May 2013. We got some problems. Man, you thought the red ring pissed people off? The Xbox One was revealed. Dumb name and all. I do remember that some members of the group went to go see Real Steel for Logan's birthday. And there's an ad in this movie for the Xbox 720. So we all assume that's what we were getting. But no, the Xbox One, not to be confused with the first Xbox. Along with the dumb name, it was also announced that the console would require you to be connected to the internet at all times to play any games. The Kinect came with the console and could not be turned off. Oh yeah, the Kinect came out late in the 360's life. I didn't know anyone that had it. I didn't have it. Moving on. And also a patent leaked that if you're watching Netflix, the Kinect could count the amount of people in the room watching and stop the movie until each person in the room had a paid subscription. What a dystopian nightmare. Did that stop us from wanting to get it? No. <laughs> Logan got a day one, so his controller has a cool decal on it that says day one, I think. It really implementing the class system early. I got the console a couple months later for my good friend Santa. Also came with need for speed. Doesn't really seem like a Santa gift. Seems more like an uncle gift. Just to be sure that I'm not lying. It's green though, so it's gonna blit. I mean, I'm in a real set. Xbox One, year one, 2014. Nothing. Sometimes I say things like, oh yeah, every kid did that. And then sometimes I say things and I get looked at in the way that non-predators don't get looked at. I mentioned before that even as a kid, I really wanted to be a YouTuber. It's pretty much been my life's goal. And here I am. And maybe, just maybe, I was a lonely kid who pretended to be friends with the YouTubers from time to time. So what if, hypothetically, I had four imaginary friends who weren't real, and we were all in a YouTube group together, and played Need for Speed Rivals, a game I didn't even like. That's like, legit sad. But it's okay because I just played that game and pretended it was GTA 5 because I didn't have anything close to it at that time. I watched a ton of the creatures, obviously a little rooster teeth on the side and around this time I got into the Vanos crew. Put a pin in that, it'll come back later. I had an Xbox One and nothing to play on it. I had a group of friends all playing online that I couldn't access and I had YouTuber groups I was watching that were playing games I also could not get. The obvious solution to this problem, I bought the 360 version when I was out with my grandpa one time because he didn't know any better and it was 18 plus so you need an adult with you to get it. One of my, we'll call him Call of Duty friends, also wanted to play it but was not allowed to. I had the game but because of storage issues I think I could not play it on my Xbox. We devised a plan. Whenever I would go over to his house, I would sneak the game into my back and play it on his console. What I imagine this was like was him legitimately playing the story missions and trying to progress and me <laughs> blowing everything up. It was a fun game. I actually have a lot of good memories of the Call of Duty house. I'm not a shooter guy by any means, but I had a lot of fun making custom maps in Halo Reach. Like, a lot of fun. Also, to this day, the only Halo game I've ever played and enjoyed. Maybe someday. So 2014 was coming to an end and I barely played any Xbox One, but the Kinect still sat in my room watching me. You may be asking, why didn't you just continue to play on the 360? But the community had moved on. My gamer group had moved on to the great unknown and I was stranded. I guess I'll just keep playing Nintendo Land. September 2014, if my billing information is to be trusted, I made three purchases on my Xbox One. Xbox Live Gold, Minecraft, the Xbox One edition, and Destiny. Oh yeah, I made my Xbox Live account September 10th, 2014, meaning I've been on this console for nearly eight years. I had already lost most of my 360 saves and I think I just forgot my password. So I needed a new account and a new name. From that day forth, I was no longer Khaki Chief 89 I was. Khaki Chief 90, which I still am to this day. Let's change the name. Capital K. H A K I C H I E F. You know, I could make this like Boys Hub Ultra or Heal Nats because, you know, I'm, I'm not Khaki Chief anymore, but when it comes to Xbox, I am. I think it's only fair. 
Anywhere else, I'm I'm just Andrew, but on on Xbox, I'm Kaki Chief 91. I was back in, and we added a couple more members in the meantime. It wasn't like a we didn't have initiation. I I guess I made the members. I was always the type of kid who would just play what I like and not compromise at all, and refuse to learn new things. But now that my primary group of friends was people I played Xbox Online with that I could potentially never see again. Even if I did, it wouldn't be for a very long time. I think I met some of them at Legoland one year, but that, that memory is really fuzzy. And I think it was Prime Bionicles time, which was something I never really got into. If I wasn't playing what the group was playing, then I'd just be sitting in a call, which was still fun, but... <coughs> but it makes me sick. I didn't live close to them, so I needed us to have games that were hangout spots. Obviously, Minecraft is a contender. It was a new console and a new account, so we couldn't keep going forward with the Man Cave server. It had updated since then. And I think we did like all we could do. For year one, we kept to ourselves, Minecraft-wise. Instead of one big shared server, we kind of just vacationed to each other's servers. My first survival world on Xbox One, I made everything into segments and boxes. And surprisingly, I have actual footage of us playing on it, like legitimately. I found this capture card for a long time and wanted to record things for even longer. Okay, so yeah, maybe I did download Destiny, but did I enjoy it? No. Average Destiny enjoyer. Legitimately, I have logged hours into this game, and I've had it for nearly a decade, and I don't think I've left the lobby. If there was one place, like location, I could use to describe my first year in Xbox Live on the Xbox One, it would be the Destiny lobby. I didn't even like the game. It seemed really vast at the time, and then we figured out there were these three pillars you could glitch your way up to, and we spent all our time doing that. My fondest Destiny memory is finally getting up there. Xbox Live chats were probably my first exposure to improv, because we all had very active imaginations. We made up a whole storyline getting up here. We said these birds were Nazis. I don't remember why. Maybe the story wasn't that good. I made my character look like Justin Bieber because I thought that would be funny. Some more purchases came and went. November 2014, it says I bought the Minecraft cartoon texture pack. Okay. Titanfall, never played it. Rayman Legends, one of the greatest platformers of all time. I also got it on the Switch. You should play it. The Evil Within. Okay. At the very end of the November list, Fibbage. Now it was on. I used Destiny Lobby as a example before, but there's a lot of things that could describe the time on Xbox Live, but I think the Jackbox series particularly had a grip on us. I'd play Jackbox games with my friends, my family, my family's friends, my gamer group. We would play deep into the night, thinking fart and cum were the funniest things in the world. But we didn't get Quiplash yet. The whole point of Quiplash is to be funny. Fibbage is a legitimate guessing game where you're supposed to deceive your friends with believable lies. But we just used it to shitpost. We never really cared about the winner, but I was determined to be the funniest. November came and went, and then it became my favorite holiday. Christmas, baby. I got the festive mashup pack, because I guess Minecraft texture packs were important to me at that time. Unlike PC, you couldn't make custom skins on console. There's an agreement among friends that you can't take someone else's gamer pick, so that way we don't get confused. But there are only like a hundred, so slim pickings. Similarly, there aren't a lot of free Minecraft skins on 360, but we all had to be different. I chose Athlete Steve, because... I was a sheltered kid. And Khaki Chief 89 was known by that skin for a long time. Khaki Chief 90 adopted the same skin, but it was a new console and a new account. And with the advent of the festive mashup pack, it was time for a new skin. So I chose the Christmas stocking, which I stayed as up until... Well, I guess I haven't changed it yet. Athlete skin was no more. I was now Christmas stocking. Also, I think this was the year we started the Christmas tradition of loading up the same creative world and building more Christmas-based things every year. It was fun. But Minecraft was childish. In 2015, it was time we grew up. I was 14. 2015. Year two. This is possibly the most documented year we've ever had, just because of the advent of Xbox capture clips. They existed before, we just never really utilized them. All we would do was remember our moments, and then in detention, I would draw fan art of us, reenacting their moments like we're a YouTuber group. Yes, that is real. We got some talks in those calls. I always talked about wanting to make videos, but at the time, I I just didn't. I mean, we were 14 at the time, and I doubt we were even a little bit funny, but I got the sense, like I knew deep down that a decent number of us would go on to do something artistic at some point. The Xbox One doesn't need the Kinect anymore, but it, I always had it plugged in, so I might as well utilize it. You can punch in a certain number of inputs to capture the last 30 seconds of gameplay in a little clip, or you could yell, 
Xbox record that Just at your console. I did the latter. I had moved into the basement of my childhood home around my 13th, 14th birthday. So my setup was down there. There was another side of the basement that my little sister would hang out in. She would just be on that side watching Netflix on our family Wii, trying to enjoy her little shows, and then hear dying laughter coming from the other room, and then a kid desperately screaming Xbox record that to please save the clip of the funny thing that just happened. I'd say the funny moments were some of what we said in the call as it was happening, but it only records the gameplay, none of the audio. And clips delete after a certain time, but all of the 2015 clips are saved for a very specific reason that we're about to get into. Instead of going about this linearly, I'm just gonna jump all around 2015 by levels of importance. Goat Simulator. I was a sheltered Nintendo kid, so I never really got to experience games that were like intentionally dumb or just broken. At the end of 2015, Fallout 4 came out and we all got it. It wasn't multiplayer, but it was fun to share our experiences through clips. It was my first exposure to a broken game and glitches that mess with everything, so I loved it. I captured every glitch I could find. I also LARPed as a pirate named Gravy Greenhood and maybe attempted to make a video about it. Obviously, I'm gonna show the best of 2015 video I made at the end because it's important to the plot, but the first editing software I ever used was the Xbox Live Clip Editor, and it's terrible. Once was a man named Gravy Greenhood. Gravy Greenhood was a hero. He was a pirate until he murdered his captain. He was a mayor for a little bit, and then the town kind of went into chaos, and for a while, he's, well, he still is. He's super into wearing dresses. But among all those things, Gravy Greenhood is also an absolute asshole. Let's, let's look at his life, shall we? He needs more confidence. The first time I clipped through the ground during a mission, it was hilarious. The fifth time, it was funny. The eighth time, it stopped being funny. There's this pirate dude you're not supposed to be able to kill until you're like a higher level, but I just hid behind a thing and kept shooting him all day. And then he died way early, so I got this, like, powerful gun very early in the game, and his corpse never disappeared. Even when I went back there, like, recently, his, they just didn't get rid of his dead body. Goat Simulator is dumb fun, but I wouldn't call it a good game. At least this game sets out to be dumb, unlike Fallout 4, which is just dumb because it's a Bethesda game. Beginning of the year, probably Christmas money, I bought Sunset Overdrive. A game very heavily inspired by Jet Set Radio and maybe a sprinkle of Just Cause. I think I enjoyed what I played of it, but then I got to this pigeon mission and it was all over. I think it may have been impossible. Maybe someday I'll give it another chance. There are a lot of games I have bought or only played a little that... That's pretty much it. I only I haven't played them or I only played them a little that I should try. Night! I have no idea what this game is, but apparently I spent $15 on it. Shovel Knight. Now this is a game I do remember liking. Nintendo was still very much behind the times in 2015, so the Xbox One was my indie machine. For better or for worse. But Shovel Knight was for better. For this specific time period, I have so many memories tied to like two games but I played a lot more. All I remember about Shovel Knight is that I really liked it and that it was good. Good game, 10 out of 10. I know that's why you came to this video, right in the right in the snap middle of it. Terraria. When it came to Destiny, I had no real interest in learning the mechanics of the game or anything about it really, so my friends carried me. When it came to Terraria, the group was like training wheels, but instead of me taking the training wheels off and now I could ride a bike, I took the training wheels off and immediately slammed into a wall. I would play with my gamer friends and they would be like, okay, we need this this villager and five glupo coins to summon the god boss cat burglar and we 100 percent the game i think and i got this cool lightsaber and then i played my own world by myself and i was like do you guys know you can make background walls i was a christmas tree obviously i had to match the stocking there's this complex crafting thing and just uh, my brain just refused so yeah I beat all of Terraria and i don't know how to play it i'm gonna list some of my 2015 purchases according to my xbox account <clears throat> WWE 2K15, Hulk Hogan DLC Pack, Sting DLC Pack, One More Match DLC, WCW DLC Pack, Hall of Pain DLC, 2K Accelerator, NXT DLC Pack, Path of the Warrior DLC Pack. What was I thinking? Guess I just, I really needed to play as Colonel Mustafa. This is the first wrestling game where I got into the universe mode. Like I said before, I had an overarching story that stretched multiple years and now consoles, and I don't remember most of it. I bought this game physical, but I got all the DLC digital. So when I went back into the game, it like, I didn't have any of the save data, probably because I deleted all the DLC a while back. 
because it takes up a lot of space and I probably thought, when am I ever going to come back to this game? I did also get 2K16 in very late 2015, so it still counts as the year and those saves are intact. And if I transferred everything over or at least remade everything to continue the story to the next game, then there should be some clues there as to what happened. Mascot 3. Okay, 2K15 must have had Mascot 2 because I know I made a new mascot with each game. It's always the first thing I make to test out what you could do with the current superstar creator. Dancing Metal Dude, Mr. E, Pee Wee Home Phone, Ronald Phillips, The Goon, no relation, Totito's King. So in these games, there's a set amount of stickers you can use when creating things, and this game was sponsored by Totino's or something, which I thought was hilarious, so I plastered that logo on everything. There was a Totino show, a Totino's title, a supposed Totino's King. In retrospect, that is still kind of funny. Oh yeah, I had five shows running, all had five to seven matches that I watched in full. I find simulations fun when they're wrestling and Tomodachi life. I think I had a lot more fun editing already existing wrestlers. I gave Slater, Ryder, and Santino their own shows and made them all GMs. Slater had a stable of guards made up of Curtis Axel, Adam Rose, and Bo Dallas. All of the jobbers around this time in the Fed were so over with me. I made Victor the champion a couple times, I think. I am the social outcast's biggest and only fans. It's a shame none of them are around anymore. The nation of contemplation is just all the members of the nation made to look stupid and silly. I just thought the nation was a stable of five guys I can make fun of with no ulterior motives, but the nation has a section on its Wikipedia article titled Black Supremacy and Gang Wars, so whoops. Let it be known, I made Tarork first and worked outwards. Mr. Macho, Albert Peterson, The Phantom, Dick Styles. I put all the horsewomen in monkey masks, even though there was a perfectly good horse mask in the game. Breeze, crazy biker gang. I have no clue what this is. I did way more with Alicia Fox in my division than the E ever did. There's the Sullivan brothers. I think one of them died tragically in my storyline. Shark Boy. Did I not think this already existed? Orangutan, that's a holdover from the early 360 years, and that's why it's spelled wrong. Seth Stubbs, his gimmick was that it was clearly just Seth Rollins in a weird monster costume, and he just refused to admit it. I put my OC in the Samoan dynasty. That's so sad and also cringe. And then I put Tropical Sun Silver in a team with Jimmy Uso. I thought of the Forgotten Sun's name first, WWE. You'll be hearing from my lawyers. Poor Jimmy Uso. I took a lot from YouTubers at this time. The only reason I started getting into universe mode was because of New Legacy Inc. New Legacy was definitely top three, but at this time, the creatures and the Vanos crew were unmatched for me. We wanted to be like them. More realistically, I wanted us to be like them. Creatures played Minecraft, Vanos crew played GTA. We had both of those covered, but they also both played Gmod and we were console gamers. I would pray for the day Gary's Mod would be added to the Xbox store, not understanding why that could not happen. Now that I have a gaming PC that I play a little more frequently, Gmod has definitely died down a lot, but 2015, that was the hot shit and we needed a replacement. E3 2014, a game called Project Spark was shown off on the Xbox Showcase. Most remembered for showing off Conquer the Squirrel for the first time in a decade to then reveal it was a game maker game. Project Spark is kind of like what Dreams is now. You could really just make whatever you wanted under a lot of constrictions. After PT got taken down from the PlayStation Store, it was remade in Project Spark. They had their own Five Nights at Freddy's. It wasn't good. They even made an official Conquer stage. Like, just make the new game already. I think it was free at the time, or at least I hope it was. But now, it's not on the Xbox store anymore. So who's the PT now, Project Spark? I still have it on my Xbox though. And of course we used it for prop hunt. I don't have a lot of footage of this, not because I didn't record it a lot, but because we didn't play it a lot. I did, I thought it was fun. Well, that was the closest we were ever gonna get. I just thought I should explain why we all had this obscure Conquer Killer game. On top of that and Fibbage, we also got hashtag IDAR, which was free. It's like a double decker side-scrolling soccer basketball. Had some good moments in there. But just like every other game, I was more interested in the creator. You can make custom characters with pixel art, custom theme songs, custom flags. I made this the Khaki Chief 90 flag because I thought rainbows were cool and I didn't think this flag already existed. I mean, which nation is this? Going down memory lane for this, I see the prototype of a lot of Boys Have Ultra stuff 
like that happened back then. So I've really been planning all this my whole life. One of the group was the hashtag Pydarb champion and they would defend it every time they played. And they had to remain the same character. I'm big into titles and championships. Also a creatures thing. The video I made in 2015 says that the current champion was me as the pumpkin priest. And I can't imagine we played any more after that, so... Reigning defending champion. If anyone wants to play me in hashtag IDARB, I'm, I'm ready to go, brother. All right, enough lollygagging around. Time to get serious. Minecraft! Okay, maybe not yet. Like I said before, 2014, everyone just kind of kept to themselves. It's hard to play a survival server when only one person has the world, so you can only play when that person is online. Realms weren't a thing on console yet. Yet. But one summer, the one in 2015, we knew we would all be home for a long time. So we started the town world. That's not what we called it at the time. It was just uh, the world, but we've had worlds since then and they all have a very specific thing that makes them stand out. And this one being a town is what this is. I'm calling it the town world. In later servers, we would all spread out and make our own little nations. But in the town server, we were a sharing economy for a little. Everyone built their cute little bases all close by each other. And I started a big project. The church. It was made of wood and it was like a thousand by a thousand blocks. So I had just terraformed all the trees in the area. One day when we were online, I legitimately had to spend the whole time trying to find saplings anywhere and replant all the trees to fix the population. Just call me Mr. Beast Burger. Stuff was calm for a while. I mean, we definitely fucked with each other. One of the members house was a spaceship and the only way to get out of it is to jump down into this water. So we put Lapis below his ship. So when he would jump out next time, he just died. One member had a tree house in a nice lush jungle. So while he was gone, we built a Shrek behind the house. And whenever he would ask about it, we would just pretend he was crazy and not acknowledge it at all. There were a couple fires. Then we, I should give some background on this first. I basically couch surfed. The only thing I had built was the church and there were no walls. So I couldn't sleep there. So I just stayed with everyone. To repay the favor of all the nice community, I set up a community chest, which people could occasionally donate stuff to the church, and if they really needed it, occasionally take things out. We played online with this one guy who was a lot younger than us. And by a lot younger, I mean two years. Uh, but when you're 14, that's a big difference. One day he made a beeline for the community chest and I could smell something was up. He didn't even look inside the chest. He just broke it and took all the supplies. Everyone had benefited from the church prior, so they were ready to return the favor. So like five Minecraft dudes were all chasing this kid with his full pockets with murderous intent. And then he begged them not to kill him. And then they killed him and he made the worst noise, it still haunts me. Like a balloon deflating while also being boiled. It was like a, <coughs> He got pretty upset after that. That's just like the plot of Aladdin, I think. And then, I don't even know if these events are related. I just thought the context was important. Somebody burned his house down and then we hung his horses from a mountain. Holy shit. That's like actually fucked up. That's why you don't Fuck with the church. 14 year olds are brutal. Well then peace was getting boring so I had to stir the pot. We made a battle cage, an arena, if you will, where players could fight and everyone else could just watch. Only with the fists, no buffs, no weapons, no armor. Just punching people. It was a fun pastime. Like hashtag Pydarb, there was a battle cage champion. And if the group of best of 2015 video is to be trusted, the last battle cage winner was Logan, so. I'm coming for you. But this wasn't enough intensity. We had to bring everyone together by any means necessary. We basically implemented a monarchy. An enchanted blaze rod. Whoever held this magical artifact would be the king of the town and could assign group projects. I completely gave up on the church and just made everyone make a group treehouse. Again, obvious creatures inspiration. I was eventually assassinated by someone and then that someone was assassinated by my roommate. The church wasn't a viable sleeping place and I already exhausted all my favors. So me and one of the other members just made this shitty little hut away from the town. He became king. And there was peace for a little while. But I was determined to get my crown back. So Logan and I made this throne room to crown him that everyone could look down on. And we told him it was, you know, it was a present for him, a group project. But in reality, we built it in a way where I could jump out of a secret compartment or jump down and quickly kill him and grab the rod, assassinating the current king and leave. Murdered his closest constituent, his roommate. It made things pretty awkward. But that couldn't be all we did. 
summer 2015. Could it? July 21st, 2015. There was a deal on Grand Theft Auto 5 and heists had recently been added. So we all got it. I didn't even bother with the campaign this time. I just bypassed the tutorial and went straight to online. Jumping back, the reason I am pretty sure when I played on 360 that I just fucked around the whole time is that I don't remember any of the campaign and I don't remember playing the campaign. I made an ugly old man who put a bag over his head to hide his shame and I was off. I go back to GTA Online now, current year, and it seems like there isn't as many fun things to do, but that's not true. I'm just doing it alone, and that's no fun. And your first steps into online are way different from your millionth step. It was all fresh and new and exciting to us, so we did all the beginner stuff. Trying to stop the train and figuring out you could clip inside the train. Trying to survive going to the military base. One of us grinded to get a gunned insurgent. The first thing I purchased was a gunless insurgent that I still use. I guess this is why I don't have as big of a problem with griefing as other people do, because you have to try really hard to blow this thing up. I've watched so many guides that say, oh, this is the first thing you should buy. This is the fastest car. This is the first property. But really, you the first thing you should buy is an insurgent. It's the best investment. You should also make it red and green, give it green smoke, shining star wheels, and Christmas horn. Keeping with the previous theme, robbing convenience stores, tank rodeo, more Vanna stuff. One of, if not the first day we played, one of us managed to find a dump truck somehow, and we jammed everyone in the back. Aside from like the limo or the jet, which we could not afford yet, there was nothing that could hold all of us. Limo and jet are expensive. Dump truck is free. We rode around in a dump truck with like five people in the back, like freaking out and hiding in the thing. We would occasionally jump out and, and just beat the shit out of people and say we were taking out the trash. The group isn't a very good name because it doesn't have a lot of point behind it and it was kind of thrown together. You can join or create clubs in GTA Online and we needed to make one. So we decided from that day on, we would be the OG DS, the OG Dump Squad. We had ranks, someone made a logo. I made us a set uniform of wife beaters with the logo on it. Even when we all lived in the same town with a community chest, we didn't feel as close as we did in the dump squad. Guns and cars are cool, but we got really into melee weapons. There wasn't a lot of them at the time, but there were like missions you could do in the game, but we were more occupied with doing our silly little games. We would go to the golf course and fight with only golf clubs. There's this little building above the lake. I don't know what it's called because I don't know what any of them are called, but you're seeing it now. If you prop up a moped in just the right way, you could get up there. So we played King of the Hill and tried to stay up there the longest. There were other game modes but not a lot yet. There's this one survival map on the Del Perro Pier that we played all the time and we hold ourselves in this back room. I don't think we ever actually beat it. Eventually they added the job maker to next gen and I was all for it. Yeah, I made the shirts, but I didn't make the logo. I feel like I had to make something and give back to the group, supply something of substance. So I made some deathmatch maps just for us. I made the official golf course deathmatch map called Golf War. Play it now. You can actually play it now. With golf clubs only, golf carts you could drive around in, and some obstacles. Nothing feels better than knowing that something I made was something we played all the time. There's a sad truth that you never know when the last time you're going to play online with your gamer friends is. It just kind of happens. But I can rest easy knowing that I'm pretty sure the last time we played GTA Online together we were on the golf course. I wanted to make an official King of the Hill map in the place we played before, but it was too small. So the Fight Club Dump Town was the next best thing. Same custom rules, you cannot fight outside of the ring and you can only use your fists. Whoever stays in the longest wins, but we didn't really care about the wins. It wasn't about points or money or KD ratios at this point. We just wanted to have fun. September 11th, 2015. I promise the date is important. We decided to get one van and the four of us slowly go around the map to hit all the tour spots in one night, like a little road trip. And this became a tradition. Every 9-11, we'd take the little shark van and go around the map, making sure to take pictures with everyone at the landmarks. It truly is the best thing to happen on 9-11. Jesus Christ. We did do some parkour maps after people started making custom ones. Some biking courses too. It hasn't gone full crazy yet, mind you. Later in the year, we got really into boats for some reason. Every session for a while would end with us boating around the edge of the map, mostly at night, like in-game night. 
but also real life night. I got a tugboat, I got a sailboat, figured out you could suck your homie's cock in the speedboat. It was great. And it perfectly lined up with the next update, which added the yacht, which we didn't know, like how could we have? Spoiler alert, I didn't get the dump squad yacht until 2016, so that part of the story, hold off, we're gonna get to it. There were other fun updates in 2015. Slasher was fun for a little bit until you figured out that you could just Slasher was at a huge disadvantage because you could just beat him to death with flashlights. Lowriders was a fun distraction after we had beaten all the other side missions. Oh, right. Speaking of updates, there was one 2015 update that happened earlier in the year, before summer 2015. Talk about work. We all love banks. You gotta speculate to accumulate. The GTA 5 heists were a fun and stressful time. You get a reward by doing them all without dying and that wasn't gonna fucking happen. But there is a reward for doing all the heists in a row with the same crew, which I don't think was done by us until... Well, it was done by them, I don't think I did it. You'll soon understand why. We could, at the very least, do them all on hard to make the most money. You had to buy a high-end apartment and pay a fee to even play the heist, so it was an investment. Remember when this was the most expensive thing in GTA Online? Oof. The Fleeka job. For someone who played this game for eight years and has a rank near the 300s, I sure am not that good at it. I was good at the hacking minigame, and I'm very thankful that the console version has auto-aim. Similar to Castle Crashers, you can jump into someone else's heist at any point and continue their progress, but you still also have your own. I think once I joined the Dump Squad heist team, they had already done this one. So all I remember about this one is starting it on my own and playing with randos and having to communicate through DMs. At this point, I was terrified of joining a party of people I don't know. Not because I thought people were dangerous, but because I thought they may find me cringe. Now I love talking to strangers on the internet. And I, I could not understand this drill. Mind you, this is the heist finale and the very end of it too. I could not wrap my head around why this drill was not working. It did not occur to me to move this stick slightly. All while I was getting bombarded with messages asking me what is taking so long. Yeah, next time, you're doing the drill. The Karuma mission was fun. I got a Caramel Karuma with the Dump Squad logo on the side. You gotta represent. The Prison Break. I think I was with the group in this one. I remember getting screamed at in an Xbox call, so. I am so terrified, even to this day, of stuff being my fault. The most relief I could feel at this time is when Mission Failed appears on screen and it was someone else's fault. Like, rip to that guy, but at least I'm okay. In the Dump Squad's defense, we had bedtimes. Like imagine playing the setups all day, like that's all you play. And then you don't even get to finish the heist because you run out of time. Worse off if you aren't the heist leader because then potentially you put in all the work and get none of the reward. It's frustrating, I get it. And nobody wants to start the day with a heist. I do remember that cheery feeling, sorry, I'm getting giddy, <laughs> of seeing a party open and then jumping in mid whatever they were doing. We didn't have a group chat or anything that would let us know when we were online. If you saw people in a party, then they were. If you didn't see a party, then they weren't. The only way to know for sure was to wait on Xbox all day and see. You couldn't get phone notifications when your friends were on at this time. I don't think so. You just had to be there, man. Oh, and speaking of flaming, if your microphone sounded bad, there would be a loud buzzing noise and everyone would mute their mics to try and suss out the imposter. Muting one at a time. Muted, you still hear the sound, unmute. Muted, still hear the sound, unmute. Muted, the sound is gone, and it's you. You're fucked. Sorry, back to the heist. The whole thing required so much flying. Something. I am terrible at. But if you're really lucky, you can avoid it. Worst case scenario, you have to trail a prison bus and then it drives to the very other end of the map so you go up there and finally steal it and then you get stuck in a ditch. Just a, a random example. Maybe I'm the problem. Maybe part of the mission is destroying a police car and you saw one of your friends blow themselves up doing this. With some missions, you can avoid getting in the way by just laying low. I was fighting for my life in these setups. My objective was to survive. Except one mission requires all four snipers to shoot multiple people all at the same time. Take a wild guess how that went. In the actual heist, the easiest role, I believe, was the prisoner. Because you could remain stealthy most of the time if you wanted to. But as the prisoner, they take away all your equipment. So if you do get in a shootout situation, you have a dinky little pistol. I used to know exploits, more realistically, 
I knew people that knew the exploits. Terraria moment, Terraria moment. The plane person can fly a secret alternate route to finish the mission faster. One time I ended up being the plane guy. Bad idea on their part, but okay. And the heist ends with everyone in planes. I take back what I said earlier. The most relieving feeling was the heist being over. After most of the missions, instead of starting the next one, they boot you out to a random street in this cutscene and you have to drive back to the apartment. There were no organizations at the time. So aside from being in passive mode, there was no way to avoid getting killed. Four people all spawn in a circle, all either immediately turn around or shoot each other, or blow everyone, including yourself, up. Maybe I shouldn't cut in the middle of the sentence after blowing everyone? The Humane Labs. Remember before what I said about laying low? So much of these missions are just about stealth and only really one person has to get to the end to activate it. I didn't even go in the labs, I waited back in the bushes. The bus or the van or whatever it is, is gonna leave the labs anyway. Just pick me up on your way out. I played the role of helicopter gunman. Again, I strategically pick the role in which I am least likely to die. Except for this one time I was put in the driver's seat of the helicopter. You can use the bumpers to turn the helicopter but that takes too long to take off, so I just lean. I immediately turn the helicopter and almost hit a couple trees, and everyone else in the call just lets out this defeated yell of anguish. But we didn't die. My risky maneuver saved us like 10 seconds. I'm really impatient when it comes to helicopters, but really careful when it comes to everything that isn't helicopters. I'm not as bad as a helicopter pilot as I thought. Series A funding. I don't remember a lot from this one probably because it's really forgettable. Yeah, like, yeah, Trevor's here, but in the ending cutscene, it's shown that the goods get taken, so really all the work we did was pointless. There's a lot of shootouts, driving boats is always fun. The only thing I do remember is getting to actually be trash men. The dump squad rides again, and then the game glitched and would not allow me to put the trash in the garbage truck. Can you hear that? Guess who got blamed for that one? The Pacific Standard Heist. Jesus Christ. Listen, after eight years and dozens of updates and new missions and tons of new stuff to do, I still think this is the hardest thing in the game. Maybe it's because I haven't played it since I was traumatized as a preteen. Maybe it's because of the money. The setups for this heist take so goddamn long. And in the second half of the finale, you carry the money, like physically on you. Not only do you lose some of the cut every time you die, you lose money every time you get shot. So honestly, if you got shot, the best course of action was to legitimately just reset the game because the alternative is never getting that money back, finishing the heist and having to do all the setups over again. Resetting was faster, but not by much. Have you seen how long this game takes to load. Especially on this cinder block of a system as fucking VCR size. The first job requires a lot of communication. Someone on the back of the bike has an app open to show where the postal trucks are and they have to relay that information to the driver. And it's impossible to do while talking to randos and DMs. Trust me. I know. Thank God it's like UPS trucks too, because I cannot tell cars apart. There are these occasional open world missions and online where someone will call you up and you can get a lot of money by bringing them a specific car, but they don't tell you where it is or what it looks like. They just say like the name of the car, which is gibberish to me. Yeah, could I get the Honda Triple Fugger Burger 290 with the hydraulics? I don't know, just give me the red one. I don't know where and when we got obsessed with boats, but it could not have been the Avi mission. You have to boat down rapids that try and tear your boat to shreds without harming your escort, and it just went entirely vertical. The next mission is staking out on a bridge for a long time. Having to redo the mission over and over and wait for the convoy to show up each time, you try and entertain yourself by going up, trying to climb up the side of the bridge. I just got a bunch of pedestrian cars and made a blockade. Sniping was involved, but I was not involved in the sniping. The mission after that, I remember a lot. Not fondly, but a lot. There's this big shootout area, and if you die there, then you spawn across the street. And let me tell you, this street was like Frogger. I have seen more people die on the way to the shootout than in the actual shootout. The finale. Oh, God. So normally, once you rob the bank, you have to escape on bikes. And again, not get shot once. Seems impossible, but then... Terraria moment. There was an exploit that has been patched out since that if you buy a certain garage, put an armored Karuma inside and then destroy the bikes at the first checkpoint, you can spawn there, take the armored Karuma instead of the bikes and not get shot at all. Of course, you still had to drive to the ending and get on a boat, but that's doable. All we had to do was get to the car without being shot. 
much harder than it sounds. All you had to do was follow the damn train. The Call of Duty friend who I shared the 360 version with came over and I let him play the mission one time and he aimed a rocket launcher out the open doors of the bank and then just as he shot, the doors closed. So he blew himself and everyone else in the heist up. The current objective was to survive. Inside the bank, you're good to chill a little bit, but once you got that money, it was serious time. We all shot magazines and lights, just killing time until the A-team got the money. You were the cool kid, in my eyes at least, if you came on the next day with a new exploit. Flipping into secret rooms, getting on top of the stripper stage, getting in the mod shop, getting in side the train. It was a fun time, man, if you didn't already pick up on that. And then we finally got to the boat at the end. And we must have done this a ton because I remember this happening multiple times. If you jump out of the boat at just the right time, it'll show you jumping out in the ending cutscene. If you jump out too early, your friends get mildly annoyed. We were just relieved to have finished all the heists. For now. And then we all spawned outside the bar and blew each other up. There was also this one mission where you have to wait for a meetup and every time we waited, we would just wail on this random green car. I don't remember what it was. It may have been a lowriders mission. We indulged in a little spending after those heists. We all got high-end apartments in our own heist room, so we did the heists over and over. In character lore, my character took off the bag finally to reveal that his face had been burned terribly. That was until they had a Christmas pajamas and nightsticks, and I went by. A new name. This costume is what I like to call Kyle Ren. As strange as it is to say, I'm nostalgic for the Star Wars sequels because like, the first one came out when I was 14. Watch this video, or it don't. It might actually be bad. So yeah, I'm nostalgic for them. I'm that old. But seeing The Force Awakens five times in a row in theaters wasn't the only thing I was doing December 2015. I was playing Fallout 4, but we already covered that. I was rolling around Los Santos with the snow on the ground in my new pajamas and had some snowball fights with the dump squad. I get very hung up on little things like that. And for whatever reason, snow in GTA Online just warms my hardened little heart. Just nostalgia, really. But it's such a small detail that really goes a long way. I remember it lasting like the whole month the first time it happened, but that can't be true because now it starts on like the 24th, which is not enough time to enjoy it before Christmas. That's not nearly enough time considering I'm usually back home at... Wait. Home. 2015, my first official year on the Xbox One had come to an end. But with all new games and all the money I got, 2016 was going to be a bigger year than ever. I didn't even mention why I'm specifically doing this March 2022. It's not the 10th anniversary. This is more my goodbye to the Xbox One. As you could tell by everything I just told you, my main thing was GTA Online. I played GTA Online on my stinky Xbox for nearly a decade and I never wanted to switch over to anything else because I didn't want to lose all the progress and time and money I put into it. March 15th, 2022. Grand Theft Auto Expanded and Enhanced releases on next-gen consoles. And you could transfer your saves to the respective next console in a time period, and if you don't do it, you won't be able to after. The window of transferring from the 360 was small, but I imagine this one's gonna be even smaller because of how much Rockstar hates hackers. Once GTA is on the Xbox Series X and I can transfer my save, I don't have it yet, just pretend it's sitting there. I'll have no need for the Xbox One. The cool thing about the Series X is I could play everything on it. I'll still be playing Xbox One games, just not on the Xbox One. This fat old thing has lasted through more gaming sessions than any console. And without problems, really, but nothing lasts forever. Everything ends eventually. And I think it's time to say goodbye to the Xbox One. All right now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my esteemed pleasure to all of you at home broadcast who I have in the studio today for this very important interview. Today, I will be interviewing Xbox Series X. A quick refresher for those not in the know, the group is a group of 12 Xbox gamers I played online with throughout most of my adolescence and I played with every day, most of which I have never actually met in real life until recently. We shared one big Minecraft world, we ran around GTA 5 together as a gang, we laughed through the night in Jackbox games, compared our Fallout 4 saves, and played a bunch of forgotten Xbox Live Arcade games. 
most of which aren't listed anymore. Last time we left off, we were fully in the GTA 5 of things. We had finished off all the heists, gotten all our high-end apartments, and we're playing around in the snow in Los Santos. Technically, the first thing I did on Xbox in 2016 is edit together the group best of 2015 video, which is the reason I have so many memories of the clips. And because of this epic funny moments compilation, I always filed all my memories of all this stuff under 2015. I'm like, oh, it all happened in 2015. But upon further inspection, a lot of stuff happened in 2016. 2016, the year people on the internet think was the last great year because it's the year they graduated high school. The best of 2015 video was made just for me and my friends in the group, but by looking at it, you could tell how clearly we were inspired or I was inspired by other YouTube groups at the time. The editing style is very heavily inspired by the Vanos crew, and a lot of the stuff we did in the videos, the bits, were taken directly from the creatures. Uh, the rest of the crew didn't know that. I don't think they watched them, so as far as they know, I came up with them, so... Rude Awakening. YouTubers had a huge impact on what I chose to play with my friends and even what I chose to play by myself. After releasing the first Xbox video, I got to sit there and slowly realize I got some information wrong. I realized it right after I uploaded it. I went through all my purchases and had this screenshot from the purchase and the game was titled NTTE, which I written my script and then maybe it autocorrected as night or maybe I read it as night and I only noticed that it was NTTE while I was editing, and by that time, it was already too late. NTTE is an acronym for No Time to Explain, an indie platformer which I first found while watching a Steam Train video, and that's why I bought it. Like I said, YouTubers controlled what I played. Talk about an influencer. But that's enough about Game Grumps. I don't want to have to talk about them ever again. We're in 2016 now, and according to my purchase history, the first purchase I made on Xbox in 2016 was... Another wall! A game I bought because... My Gooba. But also because it was on sale. It's important that you know that I did not pay full price, but it's on Game Pass now, I think, so. Never get those $10 back. We still loved GTA 5 and Minecraft, and just know throughout this entire timeline, we're still playing it actively in the background. We're just in the old server I already talked about. So whenever I'm not talking about Minecraft or GTA, just know that we are still playing it. We didn't stop in 2016. I remember starting the town world in 2015, but that doesn't mean we exclusively played it in 2015. It's actually pretty likely we played it for a couple years. There will be other worlds and we're gonna get into it. But aside from those, I feel like I needed to find the next big thing. I mean, I'm the one who said we should all get Project Spark and hashtag IDARB and I was right? That's arguable. There was also a game I missed last time titled How to Survive, and we played it all the time. And I have to assume it was free because it's not in the purchase history, and if we all had it, there's no way we all would have paid for that game. Not that it was terrible, it was fine, it just doesn't seem worth buying. That being said, it was a multiplayer game that we could all play together and share progress on. I remember playing it, but there's no video footage and no purchase history, so let's say... Played it 2015. We were console gamers, but even back then, so many games have remote play now, and of course, Parsec exists. But back then, if everyone wanted to play the game, everyone had to own it. Chivalry. At the end of January, I purchased a game called Chivalry. Chivalry is basically a first person shooter game, except it's all melee weapons and it's all about that combat. I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but I really do not mesh with first person shooters. There's no like personal vendetta I have against them. I just don't really like how they control. So while I was playing with the group for every Minecraft and GTA I was playing, there was a Destiny and Call of Duty I was not. But I've always been way more into melee anyway. When I would go over to the Call of Duty's house to play Call of Duty or Halo, I would use the knife or whatever the plasma sword is in Halo. I did also make an entire GTA deathmatch around golf clubs. Chivalry was fun for a bit and I was decently good at it, but what fun is a multiplayer game if you can't play it with the bros? I think maybe one other member had the game, but we could do so much more. I had to keep trying. My only memory of Chivalry really is that uh, my buddy Chris, former The Boy, Chris came over and we were 1v1ing this one guy in Chivalry and he started DMing us and he was very distressed and we just kept messing with him. Battle Block Theta. In March of 2016, I got Battle Block Theater. Again, I had already gotten and beaten it on 360, but for reasons I can't remember, I didn't have access to my old account. So as far as I'm concerned, Khaki Chief 90 had to start from scratch. It was a fun co-op game with some four player modes in it. But like I said, we had already all played it. So I knew at least most of them had it, but they had already moved on. None of these games were bad, mind you. I fully enjoyed all of them, but playing online with your bros, with the group, 
It's a wholly different experience. I needed to find the perfect multiplayer game that could bridge the gap of our interest while also being big enough that all of us could play while being in a call together. Walk up, Liga. Found it. If you haven't heard of it, it's soccer except with cars instead of British people. Well, by this point, there were a lot of members of the group. Most of the games we played are stuff I like to call squad games. Squad games is a type of online game where you play with a team comprised of solely four people. Even GTA V, which is like a paragon of being able to play with everybody, the heist and important missions exclusively were four players. Regardless, we had some good memories on Rocket League, but they were all in favor of the game. That sounds strange, but in GTA and Minecraft, I know I'm mentioning these two a lot, but they're like all encompassing. We would kind of goof around and make our own stories. When it came to Rocket League, it was always tied into the game. So the moments we always had were either under the categories of that was a cool shot I just made or person is raging because we lost. Rocket League was a good way to kill time in a call while waiting for other people. Hey, the person's not here yet, they're running late, let's bump out a couple matches. I guess I wanted to find the next big multiplayer game because the big two were faltering. The group didn't want to play on the town world as much because it had reached its gradual ending point. There's only so much you can do in a Minecraft world before it starts becoming boring. What we needed was an update. That being said, I did play it every chance I got. I made a town hall, I made paths between all the properties, I made a Christmas village. Come to think of it, I don't think I finished any of them, so there's Aside from the church, there's a ton of unfinished projects in that world. And this was not my server. It was saved on Logan's Xbox, so whenever I wanted to play, I was just at the mercy of whenever he wanted to play. Luckily for me, the only person that was as obsessed with Minecraft worlds as I was, was Logan. But even we knew it was getting time to wrap up the world. And GTA wasn't faring much better. Mind you, I still was interested in getting my rank up and getting every single Warstock vehicle, and they occasionally added new adversary modes to keep people entertained a little bit. And we needed a big change if we were going to play this indefinitely. And remember, this was an online game. Updates happen. Well, I'm making Do I have like a suit jacket where I can look more professional? This is something a, a business tycoon would wear, right? June 7th, 2016, we got the further adventures in finance and felony update. This update added the ability to become a CEO of a criminal organization. Of course, this came with a bunch of new vehicles and new missions, but the most important part you could hire your friends. We had the OG dump squad before it. It was fun while it lasted, but today was the day. It's not today, so that doesn't make sense. That day was the day I would cement my legacy and created Inc. Incorporated. The Inc. organization claims to do a lot of things, but in reality exists solely for dumb enjoyment. Baby's first money laundering. I used the money I saved up during the heist. <laughs> I, I didn't save that money. I spent it immediately. And then I bought an office to call our headquarters. If you've watched the previous video, and I gotta say, you really should watch the previous video, you will have noticed that all the stuff we did in GTA Online it's not really like the intended stuff. Like we weren't breaking the game or hacking. We were just making our own fun. If you become a CEO, you can invite your friends to become your associates. And while you get an RP bonus for remaining in their proximity and you get a money bonus based on how long your boss stays alive, we were more interested in how friendly fire worked. If you were in a group or organization with someone, you could not kill or damage them. And you would think this only applies to weapons, but it does not. So you see in GTA, the cause of death works off of what was the previous contact. So if you hit someone with a car and then they fall off a building and then hit the ground too hard, it will say that you ran them over. For this reason, if you are in an organization with another player, nothing you do can cause their death. You could throw explosives at them, launch them in the air, hit him with a car, even when they hit the ground, they will not die. So of course, we had to take advantage of the new meta. We immediately flocked to the top of the ink building and immediately jumped off headfirst into helicopter propellers like lemmings. We started attempting the cargo bob rodeo because we figured it's the best case to do it because it can't kill us, we can just get right back on. This clip is the one I distinctly remember yelling Xbox record that at the loudest I could and my sister coming in and being like, what was the clip, what was so funny? Uh, it was just this, but you know core memory. We were living the high life. I bought us an A-team vehicle that I wanted us to go on a road trip. We tried to drudge our way around the map while being chased by firefighters and angry pedestrians. I bought us a tugboat that we could fit with. I mentioned last time that everyone got very interested in boats, and by this point, I was the supplier. I was grinding and saving up money and buying all these exorbitant things for the group to keep them entertained because I knew we were done with the heist and it was only a matter of time before we'd run out of things to do. I was getting desperate. I had built up this aura of being able to provide new and fun things, but I could only grind for so long. I was running out of funds and the business was about to go under. 
so on June 14th, 2016, I bought two Megalodon shark cards of in-game currency, equaling a real life amount $200. I wasn't proud of it, and I'll never get that money back, nor will I live it down, but I don't regret it. It was worth it, as long as everyone thinks the business is doing well and I'm financially stable. I can't go bankrupt. The Inc. organization needs to remain afloat for the good of its employees. I'll let a million dollars die before I let this company go under. I finally folded and used real life money in a game that I did not need to use it in. The worst part? This isn't the last time. Remember last time when I said the reason I got the new console was because I needed to transfer my save to keep all the memories around? Uh, it wasn't just the memories. It's also, you know, sunk costs. This is incredibly embarrassing, but fine. Let's move on. What did I even end up buying with this money? The OG Dump Squad fought on the golf course, chilled in our apartments, and goofed around in the military base. But now we got a luxury spot to call our own. We got trash boat. Now, let me get ahead of this before this gets out of hand. I bought and named this boat when I was 15. The trash boat name is an obvious homage to regular show. I also think the name is funny. What I'm more worried about is that the title reads Trash Boat Israel. You see, it gives you an option of a ton of flags for your yacht to be based in. And I had to pick one. I thought, well, I can't pick America because that's what I am. And that's not very funny. And the Canada joke is what I would have gone for normally, but that was already done. I racked my little teen brain for what would be the funniest thing to have my yacht based on without knowing anything about the actual place. And I landed on Israel, I guess. Just know that I thought the name and the flag looked funny. This isn't a political joke. I didn't know anything in 2016. I barely know anything now. Well, I mean, if Thunder Snow was one of the songs we picked for the best of 2015 video, we picked a lot of meme songs. That means I would have been listening to Songify the News, so I would have been at least a very little bit politically literate. So people get really gatekeepy about certain YouTubers, like, ah, I like them when they were cool, stuff like that. I watched Shmo Yoho a lot as a kid, like all these remixes. So I was so proud that when the, they made the Stranger Things remix, the Chrissy Wake Up thing, and everyone's using that song now, I was like, ah, I watched these guys, ah, uh, Thunder Snow. <laughs> but nothing to do with the actual Israel. I can't really explain why this is funny beyond it being lol random. I just, I really need you guys to know this was not anti-Semitically motivated. Don't ever think that your past actions won't have consequences. They will, and we're gonna get more into edgy teen Andrew later. I am dreading it. Regardless of the name, we all hung out on this boat without any of them ever learning that I spent real funds on it until, I, I guess right now, Hi. <laughs> a good mix of the friendly fire rules of the CEO organization and the mixture of the hot tub and helicopter right next to each other resulted in us making human soup all the time. Some things just never stop being fun. I'll be on my deathbed and one of my children will put GTA 5 in front of me and I'll immediately make a beeline and jump headfirst into a helicopter. And then they'll probably turn on the game. Oh, survival evolved. With most of these survival games, I think we're all gonna spend the same amount of time on the world, but when I'm hosting it, I tend to spend the most amount of time just because I have access to it. Only a couple of them had it. I would always jump into other people's random worlds just to see what was going on. One time I jumped into a world that seemed very eerie and there was a guy chasing me around and every time he got close, because it's proximity mic, he had this ear piercing noise coming from him and he would catch me every time horrifying but in my own world i spent all my time making a boat common theme i like pirate iconography if i still have the world then you're seeing it now and if not then you're seeing an epic artist rendition of the awesome ship i built it on the beach shore where i spawned and i kept it there until i was for sure i could go out to sea because you still need food water shelter and sleep and i had all those things but i needed to find a way to make them portable so after months of preparing the ss ooga booga for its maiden voyage i set off into the great unknown where a megalodon shark ate half of it and got me stranded on land. Yeah, I don't think I spawned back on the ship even though I slept there, so, you know, that boat's gone. The whole point of me telling you these stories is, for one, I think they're funny, but it's also here to give you a glimpse into my life at the time. It's strange that while doing this whole walk down memory lane, I haven't really mentioned what was actually happening in my life. You see, 2015, I was in eighth grade, a grade I do not remember at all, but 2016, going into ninth grade, freshman year of high school, a year, I remember slightly more. I mentioned before that Logan and I had been best friends since birth, but before Xbox Live 
We would only see each other like once a year. That's because every summer, mostly around June, our two families would go on vacation together with some other people. By this time around 2016, we brought the Call of Duty friend and his family and one of my friends from my theater friend group. I had the group and I have the boys, but in between those two, my friend group, I had Garbage Bomb. But the less said about that, the better. We had a group chat on a really shady app called Kick. I wanted everyone to get team names and get us like custom beanies because even before I was in a YouTuber group, I wanted my friend group to be a YouTuber group. Luckily for me, I found like-minded individuals senior year and we all got themed hats comes full circle. If you're in high school and stuff really sucks for you right now, I know you don't want to hear this because everyone in your life tells you this and you're like, oh, well now the guy on YouTube um, is supposed to be escapism. Now he's lecturing me. The now talking, talking sponge is going to lecture us. us. I went off with a SpongeBob joke. My point is it gets better. I know you don't want to hear that and I know it's lame advice and everyone says that, but legitimately it does get better. What does this have to do with anything? Well, right before we left our swanky beach vacation, swanky, I've never said that before in my life. I purchased two new fun games we could play and those those games were Quick Black Central Full 2. The group and some other friends have been using Fibbage as our primary source of comedy, even though the point of that game is to win. But in Quiplash, the way to win is to be funny. Before the vacation, I stopped over at Logan's house and talked with him and his sister. I was telling them about Quiplash and how excited I was for it, and eventually we went over to play. And one of the prompts was about an animal or an animal enclosure or something of the like, and one of them, still can't remember which one, said, Hey. Did you hear about that kid in the gorilla enclosure? 2016 has some fond memories, but it's also full of... I mean, we made a lot of Harambe jokes. I promise you the world gets better. Every vacation we go on, we have a couple running jokes that reverberate through the stay. This year I actually managed to go, and the running jokes were incomprehensible. Saying things in the fanciest way possible, like I'm quite famished and other synonyms. We all watched the new season of Stranger Things together and every time the villain appeared on screen, the subtitles read wet squelching. We got a lot of mileage out of that one. Wet squelcher. That's what we called them. We went out to dinner and tried to guess what the top 10 best selling songs of all time were. And number five, I think the middle of the list was In the Summertime by Mungo Jerry, a man we did not know existed. Go to that video on YouTube right now and go down the comment section and you will see tons of tons of people talking about this guy like he's the second coming of Jesus Christ and also talking about how much their parents drink. Comedy gold mine. On the car ride down to the 2016 vacation, we were playing some kind of name game and I was racking my brain trying to think of what the sequel of Lion King was called, and I just burst out, uh, Lion King 2 Return of Jafar. So the entire trip, and even after that, anytime someone mentioned a sequel, the immediate subtitle would be Return of Jafar, even if it doesn't make any sense. Now that I've introduced you to comedy gold, feel free to use that joke. It's very funny. This is also the summer that Pokemon Go blew up, so we were all playing outside, running around trying to get stuff. I saw a crowd of people nearly get hit by a car to get a Snorlax, it would have been worth it. And that one, I play Pokemon Go every day. The song had come out at the time. I nailed that, by the way. Uh, and we were singing it the whole time, annoying everyone. Got stuck in everyone's heads. How is any of this relevant to your time on Xbox One? Well, that entire vacation while we were playing Quiplash, Lion King 2, Return of Jafar, Harambe, and I Play Pokemon Go were scattered throughout all of our Quiplash answers. Legitimately, all I remember doing on that vacation is occasionally going outside to do Pokemon Go stuff and then staying inside and playing Quiplash for hours. And if you played Quiplash before, then you know that once a running joke gets started, it's impossible to stop. And it didn't stop at the vacation. The group had played Fibbage before, but when we finally got Quiplash, it was over for sleeping normally. And we would stay up playing it for hours. I spent so much time trying to convince everyone to buy a game that we could all play together. Like, oh, this is the next big thing. This is, you all need to buy this game. When in reality, the best selling point was just you don't need to buy a game, all you need is a phone. Shit on Quiplash all you like, but the fact that I was the only person that owned the game and I could still play with eight members of the group completely filling a lobby, that's pretty great. Every night had a different running joke that was in all the answers. Most of them were inside jokes about their school, which I did not understand. Don't think I forgot about Drawful 2. That gave us some good moments too. I had a Microsoft Surface at the time. It's like a tablet. I used it to edit animation reviews, which you can't find anywhere, which I am thankful of, and I used that to draw. Because drawing something funny on the iPhone 4 was frustrating. And I love these Jackbox games. Don't get me wrong. It was cool that we could all play the same game, like a bunch of us. But I just wish, if I could have any wish at the time, it was that we could all play a game together online, but it's also something I like, something that they would never play. The lesson we learned from Jackbox is, 
it's a lot easier to get people to buy a game if it's free. WWE 2K16 goes free. From June 16th to 19th, WWE 2K16 was free on the Xbox store, and I knew this was my chance. So many years ago, my childhood friends got me into wrestling with a super cool wrestling game where you could do a ton of stuff. Now is my job to do the same thing in a less fun wrestling game. The reason 2K16 was going free for a short time is because they were getting ready for 2K17 to come out and they were getting ready to also shut down the online services for 2K16. They don't see the use in using one server and it incentivizes people to buy the next game. Business. Universe mode and wrestling terminology scares the hose, but everyone was down to make a kooky character in the character creator. You could do this thing where you could download a face texture to put on someone's face, but I downloaded a texture and put it on this one guy's chest. This is Caveman Jim. He's got a 100 overall. For comparison, in the same game, John Cena is 95 and Brock Lesnar is 94. I didn't make him overpowered so I could play online. I made him overpowered so I could have a monster champion. I played a lot of wrestling games on the 360 and the 360 is when I first discovered the beauty of online games, but that never extended to the wrestling games I didn't want to play them online. Even SmackDown vs. Raw 2009 had online and that was my main game. I just had no one to play it with, and I didn't want to play against randos. So these guys getting 2K16 and wanting to fuck around with the character creator and play a bunch of wacky stuff is my first experience with playing with people online in a wrestling game. And probably my last. Huh. They all made their custom characters in our first match playing online we managed to clip out of bounds because it's a 2k wrestling game. They got to see the character creator and the glitches of the game firsthand, but I was excited about the gimmicks. So we hopped into the elimination chamber and hey go figure we glitched that too. The way elimination chamber works is if you get pinned or submitted you get eliminated and you still get to spectate but you're not there anymore. But for whatever reason this guy got pinned and he was still in the ring and he was still able to fuck with shit so he did. We did a tag team hell in a cell. We broke that. I don't know if the game glitched every time we played online, because we didn't do it that often, or I just recorded every time there was a glitch, and that's why all the clips I'm seeing and like, oh, through the memories are just the glitches. But if it comes to Fallout 4, I recorded all the glitches, but also that game glitched all the time. But I know that when you're fucking around on these matches just trying to have fun, they take a long time, so we couldn't have played any more matches than this. If it was any other game, I would give it the benefit of the doubt and assume I only captured when the glitches were happening, but because it's a WWE 2K game, no, it definitely glitched every time we played. And every year after this, each of the previous games went free for a short amount of time, but we didn't get to play them because stuff changed around that time. I still kept playing them though, but we're not at 2K17 yet. We're at purple supremacy or yellow supremacy. I don't remember the context for this. The rest of the summer comprised of me buying games I would never play. Just cause three. Never played it. Mortal Kombat X. I never owned a Mortal Kombat game, but I played a lot of the 2011 reboot at both the Call of Duty friend's house and Logan's house. So I thought I could get down with the next in the series, but I guess I ended up not liking whatever I played, I guess they changed too much. I played one Mortal Kombat game and I became a purist. I used to be pretty good with Sub-Zero, but it's kind of like riding a bike. You forget how to do it after a year. Dragon Ball, son of us. This is my character, normal human boy. There's nothing wrong about him. He is a normal human boy. He's definitely not an alien wearing a normal human boy skin. He's normal human boy. He's flesh colored. I don't even like Dragon Ball. I would like to. Roblox! I am unsure of when I got Roblox, but I know it was this year because I had to take this screenshot of, at the time, the weirdest thing I had ever seen. Roblox has always been something I never really got into or understood. It's actually possible it's way more popular now than it was back then. At the time, all I knew about Roblox is I had two separate friends that each had boyfriends on Roblox when they were kids. One of them trusted me enough to send the whole chat logs of their whole e-dating experience as a kid. I can't imagine trusting anyone that much. They were hilarious. I wasn't a bully, all right? I didn't send them to anyone else, but I did make fun of her for it. The console version can't really do the things the PC version can story of my life, right? Right? But the game was free and we could play it together, so it fit the criteria of the group. We would do some speedrun courses from time to time, but most of our time on it was either in Hide and Seek or Disaster Warning. In Roblox Hide and Seek, you're in a giant map relative to your size where one person goes around trying to find where everyone is. The more person they tag and the more person join them, the easier it is to find more people, last one surviving, or when the timer runs out, you win. I didn't look any of that up, that's all from memory, so if any of that is wrong, Sorry. If you get caught, you don't really gain anything from helping the seeker. So everyone in the call knew where each person was, but we just, we wouldn't snitch. Also on the one map we played on, there was only so many secrets. Oh, did you know you can get on top of the statue? Yeah, we figured that out. 
Uh, there's nowhere else to hide. Roblox disaster warning was kind of like a proto Fall Guys. Oh, I just made myself sad. Could you imagine if Fall Guys came out and went free to play in our prime time of being preteens playing at that time? I wouldn't ever play anything else. What was I saying? Oh, yeah, the toddler game. A different disaster attacks the map and you need to be the last one standing or survive until time runs out. Sounding familiar. Unfortunately, this is not the last we will see of Roblox in this story. Oh, but speaking of block game. The Island Walls. Hey guys, look, it's Minecraft. There's Minecraft in this video. Shout out to all the people who said I'm um, their favorite Minecraft YouTuber, or that they love my Minecraft videos. I made the one. I talked about killing a kid and hanging his horses and I felt no remorse. What I'm about to talk about, I'm legitimately considering not saying it. It is sad and cringe. This world was the island world because when we started, we all separated and went to different islands. This is a far cry from the town world where we all lived walking distance from each other. I imagine we got sick of it. This whole thing isn't all from memory. It's a combination of going back to old worlds and looking at old clips. When I went back to the town world to get footage, I was flooded with memories of all the best times. When I went to this world to get footage, it seemed like something terrible had happened. First of all, on my Xbox, the world is titled Dick Potato Head Blumpkin. And I do remember that. I asked everyone in the party to give me one word to name the world. That's what we landed on. And who would have thunk it, Blumpkin was my choice, and it was a creature's reference. I think this is where the whole stalking stalking character came from, actually. After we finished on the town world, I switched my athlete skin to the Christmas stalking. I did mention that last time. And this was the first world I would be testing it out. Because in this world, we were all on different islands, I did this one bit where I'd bob up and down in the water and whisper into my mic when I was getting closer. Thus, the stalking stalking. Aside from that, I have no memories whatsoever. Not fond ones, at least. This is the closest we're ever gonna get to like a post-apocalyptic Minecraft world. I went back into this world recently and I found a partially blown up gazebo, a ransacked ice island, torches scattered everywhere, an unfinished sheep farm with three sheep and one cow, and arguably the worst part, thought experiment. I want you guys to think about what an edgy white preteen who goes to a very sheltered school would think would be funny to build in the summer of 2016. Got your guesses? I've got mine. In the island world, I built what I called Trump Tower and built a wall around the island. This sucks, dude. You hear the word cringe and it's just kind of a word, but then you're like, it's hard to pin down what cringe looks like. That expression you just saw my face go through, that was it. I could have easily taken that to the grave with me. Not only is this unfunny, but it's also just like a terrible build. It's five by five and there's no stairs. So climbing it is a nightmare. And then at the very top, the top of the world, there's my bed on a small ass platform. There's probably a reason we didn't play on this world a lot. I don't understand this. Originally, I was just gonna chalk this up to edgy teenage loser, but even at the time, 2016, I knew who he was and I didn't like him. I was upset about it. We did a mock trial at my school and he won 99% of the vote. And I was, for the first time, I was like, oh, I'm surrounded. I'm not gonna get into it. So what is this? Is this ironic? When historians dig this up hundreds of years from now, will they know it's ironic? When they dig up my corpse, will they know I was just joking when I died? What was the thing Quentin said? I, I fucking, fucking hate, hate Trump. Yeah, that. Just play that clip. What is ironic is the next Minecraft world that I am gonna talk about later. The build I did went in the complete opposite direction, but we're not there yet. So for right now, I have to sit and fester in this. Everything that happens to me from this point forward, I deserve it. I didn't really mention it because it was only partially important last time. Around this time, everything in my life was changing. The next couple years of Xbox and my life by extension... That should be switched around. I like the implication that my time on Xbox is more important than my life. This video series that was supposed to be about only my Xbox experience has now become me talking about the group, and exclusively the group, but... We know it didn't last. I said last time that I could find solace and rest easy knowing that the last time we played on GTA Online all together, we were in the Gulf War map doing the golf course deathmatch. But our last hurrah... Well, The GTA 5 heists were squad games that I mentioned before where you could have a max of four people. The GTA 5 biker update 
you could have a crew of eight. Luckily for us, we had eight active players. So on that day, the update dropped October 4th. We ceased being the OG Dump Squad and the Inc. organization, and we became the OG Dump Riders. Pretty uh, derivative. We put our little clubhouse here in the Grand Sonora Desert. It was the cheapest spot. There was a gas station built into the side of the hideout, and if you know anything about gas pumps in GTA and a driving fast vehicles very fast into them, you know where this story is going, which is a really strange design choice considering they give you a bike every time you join the crew if you don't have one. And the point of the bike is to go fast. And with that, I no longer need to be the business mogul. I'm gonna need to get that later. That's, uh, I threw it under everything. Not only was it the cheapest location, it also had the cheapest interior. I did spring for the jukebox and dart game because they came with it. The cheapest one has this giant mural of this uh, lady with her legs open and i'm sure in our infinite hilarity we gave her a name but for the life of me i can't remember i'm sure it was very funny because you could see some of the dump riders praying to her in the funny moments compilation oh yeah let's hold off on that we got branding to talk about this update came with a lot of things that we're going to get into but most of which it was clothing options you can choose to allow your biker gang to have their own clothes but that goes against everything i stand for the og dump rider attire consists of a little hard hat leather gloves tight leather pants, a shirt, and a denim cutoff jacket on top of that with the classic OG Dump Squad logo on the back. If I could make this into merch, I would, but not to sell, just for me to wear. The new update also came with some weapons, but like always, we were more interested in the melee weapons. They added a tomahawk, and again, we had the friendly fire disabled, so we would constantly ride past each other and bonk each other on the head. But even cooler, if you were riding on the back of someone's motorcycles, and most of them are two-seaters, you can lean to the left or right and swing your axe in that direction. You couldn't damage each other, but you could still knock the other person off off their bike. So we would double up and joust each other with these axes. We may have also hit a ton of passerbys, but that's not on the record. The MC clubs use this Todd losing Tiara's ass pyramid to rank the members. Obviously, if you started the club like I did, you would be the president, you would be in charge of everything. When you first join the MC club, you start as a prospect. Bottom of the period, scrappy, hungry for more. And above that is the sergeant at arms and enforcer. Ability wise, they are more or less interchangeable and they do the same thing. Thing, but sergeant is above it on the pyramid so that's the one you want to shoot for and right there in second place the highest rank you can get without actually starting the club vice president i don't care about what they can do i care about the roles whenever i started the mc club i would keep everyone at prospect unless they did whatever i deemed was a good job because even back then i was eager to tell people what to do but it didn't ever really come to actual business i mean there were business work to be done but we were jousting oh man i didn't even talk about the businesses you could start different side hustles like a weed farm or a meth lab well i don't know man You've been seeming sus lately. You all thought having a clubhouse in the middle of nowhere that's hard to reach with a booby trap right out front was a bad idea? I mean, that part was right. But this far out of the way clubhouse was extremely close to our first business acquisition, the counterfeit money. I don't know what to call it. Establishment? I was wavering on whether to call it a lab or a farm, but neither of those sound right. I know the names of these characters. That's Juanita and Carlos. I know this because of the GTA 5 Funny Moments Part 1 video. Oh yeah, the video. You sure you wouldn't rather hear about Stand Your Ground, the game mode where all the bikers had to defend an area from other attacking people in the server? We had a lot of fun with that one. No? You sure? We spent like a huge portion of time doing that. It was really fun. Fine. October 11th, 2016. The video GTA 5 Funny Moments number one was uploaded by Young Muzzy to the Young Muzzy channel. Despite having a to be continued at the end and being titled number one, it's the only video on the channel. The video opens with the song Get Your Foot Off My Foot blaring super loud in the background as we were all very big fans of the piece at the time. It's also in the best of 2015 video. The reason I didn't show the video in full is because it has a ton of copyrighted music, but mostly meme songs alongside classics like Thunder Snow and Smoke Weed Every Day Mario version. The difference is the best of 2015 video was edited in the Xbox Live video editor, and I didn't edit this one. I can make fun of my shit to the cows come home. I made it. I deserve it. Everything that happens to me, I deserve. But I can't, I don't know if I can make fun of this video because the person who made it, maybe they hold it in really high regard. And then I thought about it. 
I doubt it. The market was already flooded with funny moments videos, but if I could copy all my favorite YouTubers, why can't he? Why must he be the victim? I'm the cringe. As far as stealing bits go, I'm pretty sure the group is actually just a bit from the excommunicated. The music is too loud and the video is full with strange choice of funny moments that aren't even that funny, but little me was just ecstatic to be featured in a YouTube video. If only he knew. As consolation for me being mean to a kid that no longer exists, your homework today is to go watch GTA 5 Funny Moments number one on the Young Muzzy channel a hundred times. If enough of you do this, it'll break into the thousands, and even funnier, I won't see any of that revenue. No online gamer group lasts forever, unless you make money off it, but that's not gonna happen. This video seems like a quaint little look into games I was playing, but you have to understand, this was my life, like my adolescent for a large period of time. Around this time, yeah, I had started high school and I was starring in shows and meeting new friends, but this, Xbox, is the important through line. Everything I did on Xbox affected my real life and vice versa. And that was about to change. But first, WWE2K17. Strap in because I'm about to go super in depth about everything I remember about my WWE2K universe mode lore. There's a reason I put chapters on this video. If this seems boring to you, skip it. Where do we leave off last time? One of the Sullivan brothers turned up dead. Oh, uh, well, he's back now and he's out for revenge. Caveman Jim is still around, but the face chest texture thing doesn't work anymore, so now he is just a strong fat man. Of all the characters that have made it through multiple games, multiple consoles, multiple eras, I'm glad the misspelled orangutan has made it all the way to the end. He deserves it. Seth Stubbs is still definitely not Seth Rollins in a costume. I know I showed this clip last time, but it's actually a clip from 2K17. It's just too sick not to show again. Oh crack. Tarork has now ceased being the Totino's King, but now goes by the Giant after winning a special battle royal. Fork parody of Farouk is still around, but the rest of the nation I made is gone. Thank God. The video just started. I'm already, I've hit my limit on things that seem political or racist, but I promise aren't. That would have been the third one. That would have put me over the edge. Look how cool and epic my OC Tropical looks. He's getting a visor and slowly replacing all of his body parts with a machine, becoming more machine than man. And then when he turns fully dark, he becomes Apaco, which is like short for apocalypse. And he rides a motorcycle out to the ring. Are we sure the Trump Tower is the cringiest thing I've done? Silver is also there. Ronald Phillips, the goon, again, no relation. Mr. E continued the tradition of every game having a new mascot in each series. I don't know who the fuck Rose or El Strong Menno are. I took one look at Fernando and just assumed I made that character because I forgot that Fernando was a real guy that actually existed and I just made him look dumb. And I mentioned Dancing Metal Dude. He's one of those street performers that paints himself in toxic material and you get to throw nickels at. Oh, uh, what, my experiences aren't universal anymore? That's all the C-A-W. C-A-W stands for create a wrestler. Don't say you never learn anything. And it's down substantially from the amount I created in the previous game. That's because the amount of actual wrestlers I edited is way up. First of all, a lot of these are not interesting. A lot of them I just changed how they look and not much about the gimmick. Secondly, I should never be a fashion designer. What am I supposed to be looking at here? This is all very loud. Why did I put Baron Corbin in a gimp suit? Who can remember? I am happy to report though that my love of the undercard is still reigns true, still going strong, as the characters I gave the most development to are the Social Outcasts, the Ascension, and the Fascia Police. I love jobbers. There's a shit ton of titles here, but last time I checked, Curtis Axel is the world's champion, as it should be. I'm partial to the American Championship, not the US Championship, the American Championship. TV title that looks like a piece of shit. The internet title, this is just Zack Ryder's face with hashtag memes put across it. Video game championship, women's tag titles, I thought of it first. Like the Forgotten Sons in 2K16, there have been multiple occasions where I booked something as just like a dumb bit, as a joke, and then it happened in real life after that. They're watching me, I know they're watching me. I can't prove it, but I know they're watching. I had the big Luke war where I had Luke Gallows and Luke Harper fight each other who got to keep the name Luke. In the end, Luke Harper lost and went just by Harper. Conveniently, I do have footage of this. So I repackaged the character as just Harper. So tell me why a year later, or maybe even within that same year, Luke Harper returned on TV with just the name Harper and no Luke. He did have a big hammer, but I got the Harper part right. I will stand by the fact that I did way more with Alicia Fox in my fictional video game universe than she did in an actual decade on television. There seems to be a unified title for the four top titles of each individual show. Yeah, I had four concurrent shows running all with multiple weeks of stuff all happening in universe mode. 
How did I have so much time? No wonder I used to enjoy wrestling more. Why can't I replicate this? Triple H got the developmental. Stephanie got to run the women's show. Shane was in charge of the SmackDown style show where everything had to be blue. Oh, and I also predicted the revival being turned into comic book henchmen. I know they were Shane's henchmen because of how blue they are. A lot of the attires I changed are just color coding them to their respective shows. Why did I do this to the villains? For all the non-wrestling fans, you may remember Simon Gotch as the guy from the hit YouTube video, Simon Gotch buries Enzo Amore, which I know has showed up in your YouTube recommended at least once because I've heard multiple cases of it and it keeps showing up in mine. I watched it once. Backtracking, backtracking. All right, even the titles were blue. The last show was run by Heath Slater and his NWO style stable. Nice. A lot of this is dumb and a lot of the teams are pretty terrible names, but the fact that I called my version of the Bullet Club the straight AJ Society because it has Luke Gallows in it, I really hope you guys get this joke because I'm pretty proud of it even still. Maybe Teen Me wasn't that bad. It works on so many levels. They're straight because of AJ's relationship with the gay community. Did somebody say gay community? Oh, gay. Gay, 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 so gay. Gotta hit my quota. Watch the other videos, loser. This looks really creepy. I'm gonna record the rest of the video like this. Anyway, hey guys, remember the Xbox? I do actually like some of the attire changes. Switching Goldust and Goldberg, that's a given. Dressing up Roman Reigns like John Cena. Internet wrestling community in 2016. Dressing up Jason Jordan like a Wyatt family member. You know, now that I'm listing through them, most of these funny attires are just me switching people's attires. But the one I'm the most proud of, my crowning achievement. Christmas cane. I should have called it candy cane. Finally, my Christmas obsession is omnipresent in all the games. I don't know what's going on with Trish Stratus, but it looks pretty cool. Titus O'Neil won the money in the bag, so he became a rich mogul who was flexing his money. I did the exact same gimmick last year with Bo Dallas. That seemed like that sentence was gonna have more stuff in it, but... Big E revealing he's Mr. E's lost brother because they share the same last name. Again, under the category of stuff I'd still probably do today. As much as I would love to keep talking about this, that's all I remember. I literally talked about everything. Could I have paced myself? Could I have cut this video down so I didn't have to feature this whole wrestling part? Sure, I could have cut the whole thing out of the video. But the important thing is that I didn't. I didn't cut it out of the script, but should I cut this entire part out of the video while editing? If you see this, you will know the answer is no. Wow, very cool, Andrew. No one wanted to see that. If I seemed a little overexcited back there, it's because... I know what's coming. I've been alluding to it this whole time, this oncoming storm. The story of Xbox at the time perfectly mirrors what was going on in my life, where I was, what I was doing, what I was feeling. And again, I mentioned this a little bit. The entire time I was playing on Xbox One, Xbox Live, I was down in the basement. I finally was old enough to move downstairs, be under my own rules, take care of myself, be under my own jurisdiction, where all my games are, where everything is. I can play alone in silence. And in 2017, I lost it all. 2017 was going pretty all right so far. I went to MAGFest like I do every January, put a pin in that, setting up a lot of potential videos in the future. Put that in the same list as... What did I hint at? Bakugan? After winter break, I had to go back to school. This is normally a lull period for playing online as everyone's trying to get readjusted and being back in school. We played a lot in the summer as that was the most optimal time to play, but I do remember coming home from school and getting online immediately. It just, it took some adjusting. For my Christmas slash birthday presents, they're a couple days apart, so just more from together. I got tickets to WrestleMania 33. Again, pin in that. I'll come back to it. So many video ideas. So that was coming up in April. As far as high school goes, there were only two, sometimes three people I could talk about wrestling to. But around this time before WrestleMania, my one friend, one of the two I talked to about wrestling, got tickets for a live event in Hershey and invited me to come, which was incredibly nice of him. So that day in March, I was dropped off at his house and then we drove down to the stadium and had a nice little time watching the live event. Braun Strowman set up a bunch of tables and then ended up going through them. It was fun. After the night had ended, I was dropped off at my house. Everyone in my house was asleep, but I went inside. I went downstairs to the basement where I lived, where I slept, and it was flooded. The carpet was like a sponge intaking so much water. When you stepped in it, it felt like you were going to sink to the bottom. And I was freaking out because all of my TVs and consoles were just on the floor. Fortunately, the only thing that was truly broken was my Sega 32X. And I was bummed that we had to toss it. And then I found out a couple years later that the reason it didn't work is because I was trying it on a different Genesis. They only work with certain Genesis, Genesi. And then when I have, it's not compatible. So when I plugged it in to test it and it didn't work, I'm like, oh man, water damage. 
damage. When in reality, I had the wrong Genesis, I tossed my 32X for no reason in the long run, didn't miss much. I collect consoles and I have yet to replace that 32X. Not for any emotional reasons, I just don't think it's worth it. But down there is where I lived. It's not just where I slept. All my stuff was down there. It was my only escape when I got home from high school. I fucking hated high school. I've always been violently independent. I wanted to be left alone and take care of myself. And now I couldn't be. It was gone. My hideout was gone. And I had to move upstairs to my childhood room that I hadn't been in since I was 12 where the rest of the family was. This probably doesn't seem like a big deal and maybe I'm doing a bad job of explaining it, but the entire story I've told you up until this point, my entire time on the Xbox One, that was spent in the basement, in that exact room. And I've told stories about this room before. It's where I was all the time. So up until this point, Xbox One upstairs, unheard of. We are in uncharted waters and it's gonna get really weird. And that wasn't the only thing that changed. I don't know what happened when I turned 16, but I just know that as soon as I came back for WrestleMania, the group wasn't really playing together anymore. Kind of just naturally drifted apart. The way the group was formed was I just played online with my childhood friend and then he had all his friends from his school, but they're gone. So I guess it's about time I start playing with people from my school. Story-wise, I don't really know what to call this new crew as we didn't really have a name at the time, but I do have this old picture of a bunch of us wearing orange. Another snap of me wearing it with just the caption orange, and yes, that is a sheep sticker on my phone. Later 2017. So I'm just gonna call us the Stinky Oranges, even though most of the people we played online with are not in this picture. Moving on. If you're familiar with these videos or even just the previous Xbox video, you're gonna see a lot of returning faces and names. The new crew, the Stinky Oranges, consisted of Call of Duty friend, PlayStation friend, and Max, among some others. I know that this new crew started around April 2017 because my purchase history says that's when I bought Call of Duty Black Ops 2 and I would not buy that unprompted. Without going into the logistics of popularity and whatever that means, the first half of high school consisted of me going to school, being social, talking with everyone, and then me going home and going off the grid. When I said I was left alone in my basement, I meant it. There were times where I would, the last word that would come out of my mouth would be during school and the next word that came out of my mouth would be the next day at school. My first Snapchat streak was in 11th grade. It's not like I disliked anyone. I liked all these people and they all liked me. I was just unwilling to put myself out there and join a call, but around this time, that's where I ended up. I was playing Call of Duty online with my high school friends like every other basic teenager. I would play Black Ops with them whenever they were playing, knowing damn well that I cannot aim for shit. We got really hooked on Roblox speedrun maps when I said previously that, oh, we'll come back to Roblox. It's this. I think we played it too much. What the fuck just happened to me? I got cursed. The upside is that I got to keep playing GTA Online with a new crew. We all went out and bought these neon alien suits and roamed the city. Again, logistics of popularity and whatever that means. It was just an interesting image to see the popular kids and be in a party with them and have their game played being Roblox. Because a decent amount of them were like, yeah, I'm hard. You know, no one's cool than me. Try and get in a fight with me? I don't think so. And then they were playing fucking Roblox. And I don't know what happened to prompt this. Maybe I was just ready to move on. Maybe I accidentally left or maybe I got kicked or maybe wires got crossed at some point. But as far as the timeline goes, at this point, I was no longer a member of the OGDS crew. Spiritually, I will always be a member but business-wise, it was time for the Inc. organization to expand and get new members, a new workforce. There's like a really sharp pin in the back of this, and I've like, I've started bleeding while filming. I refuse to take it out. I'm a dummy. For each GTA crew, it needs to have four letters. So this is when I started Crew Inky, I-N-K-Y, which I still am to this day. There's more to this story, though. And becoming a businessman again brought out my worst business tendencies. On April 14th, 2017, I purchased a GTA Bull Shark card, and what is wrong with me? I'll take out a million loans to keep this company afloat. Surely at some point he must realize that the business has never once turned a profit. Oh, and by the way, speaking of spending money, because I was really bummed at the time and I guess I deserved a little treat after my solace was just flooded with icky drain water, I splurged a little a lot. On April 17th, 2017, I purchased South Park, a stick of truth. Never played it. The Bear Shark Collection. Never beat it. Overwatch. 
Sorry, did you say something? The Jackbox Party Pack 3. The third installment of the Jackbox Party Pack series consisted of games Trivia Murder Party, a game where you answer trivia and try not to die gruesomely, Quiplash 2, the sequel to the classic gut-busting comedy-based game, Quiplash. Gaspionage, I don't think I ever played that one. Bacon It, a game where you're trying to pretend you know what everyone else knows and pretending to fit in while also being a liar. This game only really works when you're playing in person. Among Us. I don't I didn't even have that written, it's kind of... Something primal in me came out. And finally, TKO, a game where you match drawings with sayings to make the best slash worst shirts known to man. Quiplash and Quiplash 2 carried the comedy banner for a long time, but in the long run, I think TKO yielded the funniest results. One very late night on a whim, we all decided to play it and had a full party of eight people and oh my god, we were hooked. I mentioned in passing that at our school, the dominant console was the Xbox One, but as far as the stinky oranges go, we had some PS4 kids that would also like to play with us. With other games like GTA and Black Ops, everyone needed to own and buy the game. You know where this is going. I've sung its praises before. With the Jackbox games, only one person needed it. So they had phones and could play with us, but because they didn't have Xboxes, we couldn't talk in parties. We talked in house parties. 2017, we used an app called House Party, which to my knowledge, doesn't exist anymore. It's a video chat app where you could video call with multiple people at a time. I don't remember there being any problems with it, but along with the other high school apps we used of Kick and Whisper, I'm sure there were predators on it. I'm still deciding on whether I should say the P files word in my video. It flags your videos immediately and gets them demonetized, but I don't really care about censorship. However, it is something that comes up a lot. I captured so many clips and screenshots about my time on Xbox, and yet I never managed to save this shirt, and that will be my biggest regret. This is an artist's interpretation of the funniest shirt in the world, and it may not be fully accurate, but it was me that drew it in the first place. It is a duck or a chicken, we never really decided. Wide stance, shooting at an egg, and the caption reads, shoot your goo. While we were playing at 2 or 3 a.m., we thought this was the funniest thing ever, and I was ecstatic because I created the saying and the image and I think maybe the shirt, so I did all the work and people thought it was awesome. This became our surrogate mascot. We drew this everywhere. This isn't admissible in court, by the way, uh, but people graffitied it all over the school. You're not rebelling the way you think you are. You're just making more work for the janitors, except they never cleaned off the shoot your goo and it remained there for years. Also, I'm pretty convinced they told the janitors to not even bother with the boys bathroom because it was a mess and it never got better <clears throat> so overwatch i searched most of the year for multiplayer games i could play with the bros but by the time i found overwatch nobody was playing i know overwatch has fallen out of public favor as of recently but man overwatch in 2017 it was crazy it took the gaming industry by storm and every company wanted their own overwatch we got a lot of garbage because of it. The ones who are paying attention will remember that I said I'm a terrible shot, and that's the reason I don't normally play shooters. But consider this. Big Hammer. Yeah, I was a Reinhardt main. Go cry about it. Very rarely am I good at online games, and maybe the console division was a little lighter because, you know, they were separated by PC and console, but I was, I, I kind of got good at it. Let me rephrase that. I was good at what I did. And what I did was protect the team, help move the objective, and occasionally hit people with a big hammer. And I was great at it. And I didn't stop at Reinhardt. When it comes to Smash Bros, I'm always more partial to playing as heavies. And Overwatch, the only difference was that they called them tanks. This whole video, both parts of the miniseries, are really just an excuse for me to show up the cool clips I've amassed over the years. Play of the game. I would play as Big Knight with Bigger Hammer, Robot Crab Alien, 2014 SJW owned compilation, and the big fat guy with the cool hook, and goddamn, it was the coolest thing ever. Why did I stop liking this game? Yeah, uh, free Hong Kong. It may surprise you to know that I did, in fact, not play as the big monkey, despite my very public love of the genre. I just didn't like how he controlled. They didn't add the hamster until after I had already stopped playing. Probably would have played him too. I do remember them adding Doomfist, but that is the last new character I played, so if that helps you understand when and why I stopped playing. And not why. I didn't stop because of Doomfist. I'm bigoted. Can't wait for the sequel. What a dumb idea. When I was in high school, I predominantly hung out with people from my high school and people at work who were twice my age. It all made sense, we were all on the same schedule, we had more or less the same amount of work, we wanted to work on stuff together, we could talk about it all on a call, and we could talk about what happened in the call the next morning. And then summer hit, 
and then it ended, and I was going into 11th grade. Crazy, considering the last time I mentioned my age, I said I was 13. We went to our yearly summer vacation with Logan's family and tried to play TKO, but it wasn't the same atmosphere as playing with those high school boys in that really shady app. But right before 11th grade, some people I used to know suddenly had a lot more free time. I don't know how it happened, but one day in early August, I was just playing online, and then I saw a bunch of old friends in a party and decided, I wonder what they're up to. And I joined the party. You thought the group was done forever? You got another thing coming. You see, it made more sense to play with high school chums when high school was happening. But in summer and winter, high school wasn't happening. I really gotta proofread this. Since we last played Minecraft, they had added a Hunger Games mode. I know that's not what it's called, but that's what it is. I distinctly remember as a kid being at the Call of Duty friend's house because he got really into Hunger Games. We were playing Minecraft Hunger Games because my computer couldn't run it. His older brother had it, we were playing it. And I said out loud, I said this, they should make a Hunger Games video game. I think it would make them a lot of money. And now, decade down the line, the biggest thing still to this day is Battle Royale games. I could have made, what was it, Universal? A lot of money. But Minecraft did it first. If this archived footage from around the time is correct, then on Xbox we flooded the server with members of our own and absolutely dominated the game. I'm spectating here, so I'm not even in the game, but like here you can see the final three made up entirely of members of the group and Big Man. Oh, the ballad of Big Man. It says right here that the rules of the Xbox clearly state your original gamer tag is made for you, and if you don't like it, then you can change it once for free. Emphasis on once. So basically for those of you with no reading comprehension, you could change your name once for free, but after that, it would cost you. At this point as a teenager, this made sense, and it's like, oh, that's fair. Upon getting a Steam account and looking back, what the fuck? If you wanna prevent people from changing their names all the time, I don't know, you could just put a limit on it. This is not for the greater good of the online community. This is simply a predatory business practice. I would be more mad about this if the big man story was not hilarious. The member of the group who I lived with in the town world and then eventually usurped and killed and became the next king with the blaze rod, you really should watch the first video in this miniseries, decided one day that he should change his god-given Xbox One Live gamer tag. Or so I thought. I remember this as him picking the name Big Man and then hopping in a party to all of us immediately making fun of him. And I just like, oh, he thought it would be a good name. That makes it funny. But upon talking to one of the members of the group recently, I realized I remembered this wrong. Two of the other members of the group were logged in in his account somehow and without him knowing, changed his name to Big Man. Which we don't even think is a randomly generated name. It is just perfectly terrible. So when he hopped in the party with the name, he was equally as confused as we were vexed by it. Which while unfortunate, is still hilarious, if not even more funny. Like, it's not a good name. Like none of us had good gamer tags, but this was uniquely terrible. Everyone's gamer tags are in the footage I'm showing, so if you really wanted to, you could reverse engineer and figure out who everyone is, but a lot of them don't play online anymore, and I just, I don't, I don't have the same connection with a lot of them, so I don't wanna, it's not doxing, but I don't wanna make it super public. And because he doesn't use Xbox as much anymore, his name to this day is still Big Man, with some stuff after it that I won't tell you. I know it's a risk, but I really felt like I had to share this story. We were real fucked up. After a while, we got pretty bored of playing the Minecraft minigame collection. We were all reminiscing about the good times, and then someone in the party piped up and said, Hey, why don't we just make a new Minecraft world? I guess we didn't consider that. The mountain wolves! The nature of the town world is that we were all super close to each other. We lived blocks apart. Not city blocks, mine, you know, Minecraft blocks. So if anything happened, everyone would know about it. See previously, community chest. But the mountain world was named as such because everyone lived on a different mountain, so interaction was scarce. We call it the mountain world now because we all lived on top of mountains, but in my Xbox, it is called Pokemon Go to the Poles, which political affiliation be damned is still very funny to me. Speaking of politics, the last world I was super embarrassed to show off because of the whole Trump Tower thing, and then I mentioned that the next world would go in the exact opposite direction, 
This is that world. Dude, Pride Rock! We may not have spent as much time together, like adventuring together, but because of that, each of our projects were super extravagant and time consuming. Last time I mentioned I made my own hashtag IDARB flag a rainbow, just because I like the rainbow aesthetic. This mountain came from the same love of rainbows without any affiliation, but then I figured out what rainbows mean, and the name Pride Rock stuck out in my head, and I'm like, that's too funny, we gotta roll with that. Gay people keep ruining my love of rainbows, why must they take everything from me. And by exuberant, I mean, I'll give you a tour. It started out as just the mountain, but the more I played, the more I started to ransack the rest of the island. It's kind of like a metaphor or like an illusion. I'm one of those big companies that changes my logo to a rainbow while also making the planet worse for everyone. Also, I still did build a wall in this world. This timeline is kind of loose. I needed to put it together with what stuff I remember, what stuff was going on in the real world, and when each clip was. An easy way to tell with Minecraft worlds is by going through when they added each update. Console Minecraft was behind PC, but it updated a lot, but very rarely were there big updates. But every time there was, we realized it was time to move on to a new world because your old worlds don't really update with certain updates depending on what biomes they add. The only reason I bring this up is because a big contending factor of this being the summer of 2017 is that Pride Rock is covered with colored concrete, banners, beds, terracotta, wool, glass, and llamas, each wearing different colors. Anything you could color in the game, and everything you could color in the game. I took this new color and llama update to heart, I guess. I not only wanted the mountain to be made up of all the colors in the game, I wanted it to be made of everything that you could color. The walkway in is glazed with colored terracotta. Then you are greeted by leather armor colored every color in the game, all on armor stands. You follow the rainbow carpet up, path right up the mountain. The path up the mountain is made up of colored concrete powder, all placed above ugly cobblestone that clashes because those are blocks that fall. I guess I I could have picked a color a colored block that doesn't fall. I'm realizing this now. I spent so much time on this mountain. I was like, "Oh, it's a time thing." I would have What is wrong with me? The mountain itself, it's not hollowed out, mind you, is made entirely of colored wool. At the top of this mountain hanging off the side is this precarious platform separated by colored concrete with each different color of llama in between each pen. Don't ask me how I got them all up there, and definitely don't ask me how I managed to get them down. You can't even ride the llamas in this game. You have to use a lead to lead them, so rope tied around them, holding the other end, giant platform that's very skinny, do the math. Let's call it poetic justice. I had it coming. You walk through this colored glass tunnel lined with colored banners to reach all the colored beds. The bedroom, and you know, it's beautiful on the outside. But you don't get to own the happiest place on earth without a couple of fronts to nature. Crack a few eggs to make an omelet. If you take a peek below the deck, you will see a sea of colored sheep just ready for breeding and shearing. Wait a minute, Andrew. I thought sheep only grow wool back when they eat grass. How'd you get grass underground? Why'd you keep them underground? To answer both questions in a convenient manner, I left a little sun opening to let grass lead down to the underground, and I kept them underground to crush their spirits. I don't know why I don't see more of these in other worlds. This is my cocoa farm. Coca farm can't make a rainbow without brown. It's also next to this line of cauldrons all filled with different colored water I took it to heart. I said hey everything that you can color in the game needs to be on this mountain But it's all just ugly poop water colors So even back then I was like yeah, just put them in the ground if you look at the mountain from way in the air You'll see a beautiful sight But if you zoom out a little bit more you'll see that all the surrounding deserts have been completely drained I needed the wool for the mountain but I needed the glass for the one-for-one -one recreation of Super Mario Kart's Rainbow Road. Don't look so impressed. I did this all in survival mode. Did I have to drain the planet a little bit? Yeah, but look at it, it's pretty. While flying around to get some footage, I found this turtle trapped in the inside of the walls. And you would think that maybe it's just a cool accident, but thinking back to 2017 me, I definitely trapped that turtle on the island on purpose. I don't remember if I named him, so let's call him Steve or Harry, whichever you prefer. I'm not your dad. The first time I went there without getting footage, I witnessed the turtle push a chicken into a cactus and die. If you're seeing it now, then and I managed to replicate it by putting a different chicken in there. Speaking of animals in bad conditions, each layer of the mountain as you go up has a different secret compartment. A lot of them were just stuff I could keep there so I wouldn't have to leave the mountain. There's the enchanting section, there's the nether farm, stuff like that. You also got a sad little pen of a couple horses hanging over the balcony um, with blocks too small that they can't fit out of and I can't even ride them out of. So terrible conditions. 
I should be put in like a ward. And as far as the rest of the island go, there are a ton of farms and just weird inventions scattered throughout. This over here is the saddest farm I have ever seen. I don't even know what it's for. Looks like beetroot. Of course, the traditional farm is looking better and I got my own tree farm as to not replicate the church incident. I got a skeleton mob spawner. Again, all in survival. No wonder I never wanted to leave. This island, I lucked out crazy. Over here, we got a spiral staircase that leads down to a cave. Over here, we got a redstone contraption that I don't think does anything. Over here, we got, uh... This is, um, a tower. A building made out of furnaces. The purpose of which I don't seem to recall. And you can't stack furnaces without accidentally opening the furnace, so I made dirt scaffolding. So I guess it's unfinished. I, I had big plans. The centerpiece of the mountain part of the island that isn't the mountain or the rainbow road is the treehouse. I mentioned before that the thing that got me into Minecraft in the first place was the creatures, so by law, every new world I get, I am required to build a treehouse. Yeah, it's a nice little tribute. It takes you all the way up to the rainbow road, and above that, the branches lead to nowhere. As along with the spiral staircases that go straight down into caves, I also have a fake waterfall with a secret hidden cave behind it. I mean, an artificial waterfall with nothing hid behind it. Don't, don't look there, please, uh, don't look there. We better check this guy's hard drive. Speaking of outing secret hideouts, Logan's place was halfway across the map in this little mountain hideaway. Looks completely innocuous, right? It's got a nice little farm, a mob spawner, a waterfall to help me get my llamas up to his house, a uh, button on the wall, but if you hit the button, it opens up a secret compartment to the Chateau Mountain Underground, where you will see a wide array of modern art, beautiful armory, fantastic flooring. I broke into his house to record this footage. I don't think he's gonna know. Like I said, we didn't all spend a lot of time together, but we each took on heftier projects because of it, to compensate. I mean, in all fairness, the Rainbow Road is definitely way harder to make than the church was, and I didn't even finish that. While we weren't in a giant town, I still wanted a convenient way to get to everyone's places to keep tabs, so across from the Pride Rock Mountain is a path that splits two ways. Immediately across the island, the perfect view from mine is a nice little island with a house built on it with a blown up YM assumedly young muzzy. And while capturing this, I thought I was real smart for figuring that out, and then I turned around the other side and realized there was a sign above the door that says Uzi's place. And while looking around this world, we actually put signs everywhere. Like, they weren't added in this update. They existed before. We just went crazy with them this time. Read in the comments of the last video, someone mentioned that the spaceship from the previous world was the UNSC frigate from Halo, and the same guy in this world built the same thing again, but with lava coming out of it. It looks really cool, but it's made of glass, like the ceiling's glass, and it's in a snow biome, so you look up and it's just, you can't see through anything, it's covered. The sign outside of that says, welcome to the place, which, yeah? No lies in that. There's a random structure in the middle of nowhere, like it's not close to anything, with a sign that says, let me grab your cheeks, and then a trapdoor right in front of it. Trapdoor leads down into a cave where all the blocks have been replaced with cobblestone, which is, to put it lightly, psychotic. Like, I know I replaced a mountain with wool, but this is, who will see this? Who did this? The Woodland Mansion was added either in the next update or in the same update, so we managed to come across one, and the sign right outside it claims that me and my former roommate also lived in this mansion. It was a new update, and we were mostly in the dark about it, so I guess we were just trying to trick people into thinking that we built it. It makes sense where all the carpet came from, if the sheep underground do not already explain. I ransacked the place. The story of how I found this mansion was that from the mountain world, I went inside the nether, got a little lost, built a separate nether portal in the nether, and then came out, turned to the side, and there it was. Like I said, crazy luck in this world. I built this nice little treehouse platform around the portal as to not kill myself every time I wanted to visit my vacation home. Anyway, moving on from the signs, the YM house is pretty empty. You go inside, it's a hole. Just a big hole in the living room and then a separate, I wouldn't call it a house, but it's the same size as the already house built on the other side. I'm glad that there's not a lot of gravity in this game because the structural integrity is enough to make you squirm. That being said, the side room does look a lot better. I think you put more effort into that. I like it. It gets a pass from me, you know, the authority in Minecraft. I don't know exactly who built this one, but there's a little glass style house that's like perfectly circular. Well, not perfectly, it's Minecraft, but circular. And there's a very similar structure built in the town world by these two other people we played with. So I would assume that they built the same one, but it's right across from the mansion, which means that either someone, either me or my roommate built it across from the mansion, 
or those two built it thought they saw the mansion like oh my god we finally found a mansion and then read the signs outside that we colonized it i mentioned the previous world being post-apocalyptic but this is like hero brian world there's a random f-shaped building in the middle of nowhere and the inside is completely renovated like you could tell how much progress someone has made on a minecraft house by if the ground is made of dirt or the ground is made of different material. It's actually pretty creepy, but also interesting. We all played on this world, but in the town world, I could see what everyone was doing. Whereas this, I flown around and found a bunch of random structures I've never seen. And I'm just going off of what I found. So there could be also a bunch of other structures that I just don't know about. The last big landmark I do know is important is this completely empty mountaintop. But isn't it weird that it's completely flat? Like that isn't naturally flat. That's man-made. It's also covered in torches, which yeah, someone adventuring could do that, but they're very spread out. I can't confirm this, and I can't prove it, but I am fairly certain there used to be a giant fidget spinner on this mountain. I remember someone making a giant fidget spinner in one of the two worlds I talked about today, and as far as mountain tops go, this is the mountain world. I feel like it has to be this one. And it couldn't have been the town world because I don't think they existed at the time. And even if they did, they wouldn't have been popular and we wouldn't have known about them. Originally, I thought it could have been the island world and was prepared to talk about it there. But I remember being on top of a mountain. This is the mountain world. And this mountain top is completely flat with torches all around. I feel like it had to be here. But now I seem crazy because someone destroyed the fidget spinner. And I don't know if anyone else remembers it. I hope so. They could easily gaslight me if they wanted to. I really had it coming. I definitely remember there being a fidget spinner on top of this mountain. I, I can't prove it. I know it was there though. I promise I'm not making this up. It was here. I'm a fidget truther. The only other evidence I have of anything happening in this world is Logan trying to build an infinite moving machine to transport him from my mountain to his and it immediately dropping him and leaving him to die and upon going back to this world to write the actual script and capture some footage i found it still pushing along even if you're hearing this a decade from now watching the video back for nostalgia some say still to this day it's moving the rest of the summer was pretty uneventful overwatch held their first annual lucio ball event and there was a period of time before I fully fell out of Overwatch, but after I played it regularly, where I would still come back for every big holiday thing, so I'd come back for this. Playing it in the Christmas with all the Christmas special stuff, that was really fun too. The only reason I would ever play my. And around this time, going through purchases, somebody bought a $20 GTA shark cart. Wonder who it was. I may be ready to admit I have a problem. Nothing about this miniseries says that I solely have to stick to multiplayer games I played online with my friends. I mean, I did make the rules. But when it comes to single player games, there's not a lot to say that couldn't be in its own future video. I did mention that I had a lot of 360 games, but they all fell into five different categories of wrestling, Disney, Skylanders, Sonic, Star Wars. How did I forget about Star Wars? I did a whole thing about it. It's important to note that one of those five is Sonic, and I'm I'm not a hater, but I always tell the story of my experience with the blue blur, is as far as I'm concerned, Sonic is in the public domain, where as a kid, I never played any official games or watched the official show. I learned about Sonic by playing Flash games and watching YouTube videos or like videos on Newgrounds. And then I got two plushies from like a fair, and they were definitely bootleg. So I had a Tails and Shadow plushie, Characters I only knew because of the internet and they were both bootleg. I never owned any official Sonic thing And that is true I didn't get any of these Sonic games until my teenage is where I'm like, yeah I want to collect these I didn't get Sonic 06 because I thought it was gonna be a good game I got it because I knew it wasn't one time Chris came over to my house I actually think it's the same time he came over for the chivalry thing and we loaded in Sonic and the Genesis collection But instead of playing an actual Sonic game, we played this game called comic zone for the entire day trying to beat it And then we didn't and the story continues. I also didn't want to mention it before as it would spoil what was going to happen in the story, but the chivalry thing I mentioned earlier while we were playing chivalry, that was in upstairs. So that was post flood, but I couldn't mention like, oh, we were upstairs because that would have given it away. Not that it really matters now that I'm thinking about it. What I'm trying to say is I got a ton of bullshit around this time, but unlike the rare replay, Forza Horizon 3, Halo Warthog, and Final Station, which were all free, that's an important thing as to why I have them. I got Sonic Mania around this time with real money. I bought it. Sonic Mania is a good game, despite some issues. I mean, it is held back by the arcade control system of the Genesis, and the one, count them, one clip I have of this game is the game glitching, 
but I remember it being good. There's like six main buttons on this thing. A lot of these buttons in game don't do anything, but jump and spin dash, still tied to the same button. By this time, 2017 was coming to an end and I had my fun, but I wasn't ready to be done with purchases. So I pre-ordered WWE 2K18 like two days before it came out. I was wondering why I bothered pre-ordering the game as it was a couple days before release. And then I remembered that the game had a Kurt Angle pre-order bonus. Totally get it, totally justified. The story continues on and is carried over from the previous game and on to the next game. But this time around, there's not as many new characters. The only new creations are Ice Tank and Mascot 5.8. What happened here? You may think that the Doctor is a new addition, but in reality, that is a long callback to a character I had in one of the 360 games. He just retired a little bit. There's so much lore here, most of which I don't remember, and all of which I can't imagine you guys care that much about. Returning classics like Caveman Jim, Dancing Glowing Golden Dude, they added glowing textures in this game, Fork the Goon, again, no relation, Mr. E Orangutan, still spelled wrong, Ronald F Fingers Phillips, oh my god, that stuttered me, Seth Stubbs, Silver to Rourke, no longer the king, no longer the giant, Todd Sullivan by himself, I think his brother died for real this time, or maybe it was the previous, I don't know. Maybe I, I called the brother dying thing too early. Maybe this is when it happens. And of course, the only constant, Tropical. Ah, oh, he's so cool. The championships and shows are more or less the same. The GM roles have been given back to Slater, Ryder, Shane, and Triple H. Oh, and by the way, just to date myself, the day I'm recording this, in real life, Triple H has been given creative control of like the whole WWE, which is awesome, by the way. I'm not even being sarcastic. I'm pretty hyped for this. There's honestly not a lot of new creations to talk about, but I do want to show everyone how much better I got at naming things. I renamed the Twin Towers to A Tragedy, which is a marked improvement. Rusev and Rhino named Horn and Sickle because Rhino, Horn, Russia, Hounds of Injustice, La Familia, The Unmasked, The Super Bludgeon Brothers. I have no clue what's going on here, but I kind of dig it. The Varsity Club instills in me an equal amount of confusion and excitement. Wild and Wilder, because one's a monkey and one, his last name's Wilder. He's also wearing a monkey suit. Writer's Guild instead of Authors of Pain, just a colon instead of the colognes. I came up with the name Gun Club years before AEW did, so again, I am owed royalties. And I never ended up getting 2K20. It's like famously one of the worst wrestling games and barely ran. The Switch version is like comically like, oh my God, this is garbage. But I couldn't have known that until after the game was already out for a while. And I normally get the games at launch. I mean, I pre-ordered this game, but it's just interesting to note that at launch around 2019 when the game came out i was like ah i don't need this one and then they didn't even make 2k21 so the next 2k22 which was the next one i'm like yeah i'll get it i'll get back into it and i honestly think the release of the ascension around the same time directly correlated to me falling out of love with wrestling or at least specifically the games who am i gonna put as my main champ if victor's not in the game anymore and now all the social outcasts and the fascia police have been released i feel nothing anymore I will never love again. At least we still got the New Day, so I can keep pushing these three equally dumb attires. Biggie being related to mystery, though, still gets me. At this point, I felt that enough time had elapsed that I was ready to move on to the basement, getting ready for whatever the next flood could be, because life doesn't have highs without downs. If you want to be able to experience the good parts of life, you need to be ready to experience the bad parts. You need to open your heart to let it break at all. I can't just close myself off. If I really want to do the best parts of life, I need to be ready for heartbreak if that is to happen. That's the human condition. That's life. I'm talking about a basement. I also wanted to scream late at night without disturbing my family. I separate my time on Xbox One into four eras. The group, stinky oranges, pink room, and pandemic but obviously we aren't there yet. We have been in 2017 for so long, and by the time I moved downstairs, it wasn't even over yet. Something was still in the horizon, December 2017. The doomsday scenario. Mushroom clouds, fallout. Oh, it's supposed to be at a potluck. Say hello, Clifford. You're embarrassing me, Avon. M for mature. My character had gone through a lot of persona. My character had gone through a lot of persona changes. Like, I didn't even mention Rainbow Man, the rainbow-colored vigilante uh, that people don't know the identity of. It could be anyone, really. 
Pretend I didn't mention this. Again with the rainbows, you learn one Mickey Mouse Clubhouse song and you think you're a genius. But around the Doomsday update, he became the horse doctor. He had this whole arc of self-acceptance and finally taking the bag off and being like, this is me, this is what I'm like. And then he put a horse mask over his face. <laughs> Put that bag back on! The Doomsday Heist, like most modern GTA updates, required you to buy a new property. The facility. I think they added vehicle cargo and the hangar between this and bikers, but I did not care. Nor do I. Staunch, staying in my stance. Of course, already in GTA, I had the Christmas-based insurgent. In Terraria, I was a Christmas tree. In Minecraft, I was the stocking Christmas stocking. Again in GTA, we got Christmas facility. Huh? It's a fresh take on an old idea. I'm talking red floors with green banisters. Even the thruster has a snowflake red pattern on it. The inside of the Avenger was green, but around Christmas that had Christmas lights in it. It looks way better only in that like week period. You could tell by the stuff I just listed. This was the update. They finally pulled the trigger on the futuristic stuff. People wanted this for so long and then they finally added it and now people want it gone. I get that you don't want to get shot, but the oppressor helps me avoid people. But I didn't get any of this stuff until after I got the heist payout. So let's focus on that. While the Doomsday Heist innovated a lot of things we see in modern GTA, you still couldn't do the heist alone yet. You needed a minimum of two people. Having the group back together one last time to play on that mic server was fun while it lasted but you know summer was over and i guess everyone was busy that winter break god this shit is so hot if you see me not wearing the jacket in the other sections you'll know why so because the group and whatever i called the orange crew weren't playing together i had to pick randos so i was back to soloing and if we could take anything away from the last video any one thing is that doing heists with randos Sucks. As much as I have a soft spot for the original heist and the heist update and everyone thinks the newer ones are better, the Doomsday Heist I think is the most well-rounded and the most like an actual video game. The data breaches! A good game doesn't slow your progression with a bunch of boring tutorials. It teaches you how the game works by having you actively engage with it. They introduce it in a safe environment, then they test you a little bit, and then they push you into the actual challenge. That's how games are supposed to work. In previous heists or missions, the game was already out for a decent amount of time, so there wasn't a lot to introduce beyond fly helicopter, drive car, shoot man. But with the Doomsday update, they actually did add a ton of stuff that has a little bit of a learning curve and may surprise a lot of players. There are three heists, and by that I mean three acts of one big heist, basically, and each have individual setups, but to start the setups, you need to do prep missions where you steal vehicles from free mode. Free mode is the public session, so while most missions you're just by yourself with your crew, to get this stuff in free mode, you have to avoid everyone else playing the game. But aside from that, you basically just have to go to a random point on the map and steal a vehicle, easy, boring, let's move on. The first setup in the data breaches heist is basically just for story and continuity to set it all up. Oh, that's why it's called a setup. I'm dumb. One team has to go undercover inside a hospital and search a bunch of bodies for intel. Another team has to fly and target a helicopter. What did I say last time? I'm really impatient when it comes to helicopters, but really careful when it comes to everything that isn't helicopters. Oh no. So yeah, I was the one that ended up flying the copter. I have no clue why people still make me do that. The next setup is actually when it starts to teach you stuff. Not only teach you the mechanics of a new car, but teach you stuff you will need to know for the other setups and the heist. The setup revolves around the Deluxo, a new vehicle that has a ton of tricks up its sleeve. What am I, a marketer? The first part of this mission consists of you driving behind a truck and having to hack it. I love that hacking in this game is time to open the hack app on my special smartphone and then you just wait for the loading screen to pull up. It's like, oh man, I'm in, I hacked it. As a famous hacker, I can let you know, this is very accurate to real life. You chase down three trucks and you hack all of them and then a new target blips on your map and it's in the ocean. Then the instructions let you know, hey, you should drive this thing into the water. And I know I'm arguing right now how cool this mission is and how well it teaches you the mechanics of the new car in the game, uh, but I'm fucking stupid, so I drove the car right into the ocean. I couldn't figure out how to make it float. It was a new concept to me. Luckily, I failed the mission for the entire team. I did then find out how to float, and then the next try, accidentally hit the same button and sank the car to the bottom of the ocean for a second time in a very short amount of time. Despite fucking up multiple times, I eventually made it to the last phase, hacking a plane. If the hacking was the lesson and the water was the homework, the plane is the final exam. I now knew this thing could float, but fly? You chase behind this plane as it's about to take off and then it takes off without you and you think, damn, I didn't do it in time, it took off. And then a message appears on your screen 
to fly after the plane. So you hit some more buttons I can't remember and the Deluxo takes off in the air and now you're in an aerial chase fight in this flying future car chasing a plane and hacking from your smartphone. This is gonna seem really corny as we are now accustomed to this now, but when I first saw this, when I first played this, when I first took flight, it blew my mind. I was, I gasped. I was just really excited. And then after you hack the plane, you get to shoot it down while avoiding helicopters. I know I have my complaints, but sometimes this game rocks. The final setup, you sneak into a building, avoid people, and then eventually have to shoot the people and then hack some computers and then helicopter away. I just described the whole thing. At least the hacking in this setup is a legitimate puzzles. I may be a terrible shot and also terrible at flying helicopters, but goddamn if I'm not good at little, little puzzles. This setup does at least get you ready for the heist finale where you do the exact same thing and you break into a facility that's just the reused model of your own facility and the deluxos aren't even a part of it. Why did we learn that? When it was marketed and announced, it's like, oh man, three new heists in the update, but each heist is a different act of the same story. So act one, act two, act three. So the two heists that aren't act three can't have a sense of finality. They just kind of end and it's like, ah, good luck fucker, go on to the next one. We get some plot. There's some guy named Bogdan. He looks harmless. I'm sure he won't be a problem. The Bogdan problem. Nice one. I have vague memories of in the setups for the Bogdan problem heist, dying multiple times in random shootouts in a random location, and I couldn't pinpoint which setup it was. That's because it's all of them. First setup, you go into a hangar, you use your night vision goggles to slowly fight your way to the front. I'm not gonna pretend like I was fantastic at this because I died over and over at this, and when I was playing with randos, people kept leaving. I had to get a new whole crew, wait for them to drive back to the hangar again. But after enough times of dying, you know, you learn from your mistakes, I figured out the perfect run, the perfect people to shoot, the perfect direction to move, the perfect cover to hide behind, and then when I mastered it, the randos kept dying. Random people had to join the crew because I wasn't playing with anyone at this time and you need a minimum of two people to do the setups and the heist and they kept dying and dying and dying and dying and dying. And the worst part about this, they left after that. They died a bunch of times. We sunk so many hours into it. And then after the second hour, they're like, you know what? Nah, this isn't worth it. And then left. You're never gonna get that two hours back. They bail. I just wanna do the mission on my own. It'd probably be easier if I did it on my own. Oh man, a high rank GTA player thinks that people are holding him back. They weren't even trying. I am never at peace. Weird way to start this sentence. Either I'm doing super well and everyone else is annoying me, or I'm doing terribly and I am fearful about the people I've never met will hate me or like message me and harass me because I messed up one thing and I'm like, oh man, strangers on the internet hate me. You know, not a lot has changed. After hours and hours and days of attempting this, I mastered the shootout and then to speed up the process, you're up at the rafters and then everyone's dead and you get to get down to the jet. And I thought, hey, what if I jump down. He killed me, I die. And then it spawns you back at the beginning of the hangar, before the shootout, before everything I just mentioned. I was having a crisis. Maybe I'm the reason they all left. The rescue ULP setup mission is this, but the worst of both. There are two teams, the ground team and the rescue team. The rescue team has to go inside this building, have a giant shootout, shoot all the people, rescue this guy, and manage to get him out. The ground team stays on the outside in a little sniper's perch and takes out everyone that tries to run inside, making the rescue team's job a little bit easier. Every time I did this, I ended up being rescue team, so I asked this as a genuine question to all the people that played ground team what do you do i'm fighting for my life in here rambo style by myself because every time i try and get randos they immediately bail i got enough on my plate trying to fight my way through the building so tell me why i have a bunch of dudes coming up from the rear you're supposed to be guarding legitimately what are you what do you do i'm dragging myself through hell and you're up playing with your worm salvage hard drives i get a break i remember playing this mission a lot so either I restarted the heist multiple times to keep doing it, I kept joining other people and just this was the most popular mission, or I kept failing this over and over. Some of these missions are nearly impossible to be done with anything less than a full squad of four people. Some of these missions are can be done by one person and don't need the extra. I mentioned that I grinded before, ground, grinded, but that just consisted of me joining random contact missions and they all autoplay after another occasionally and I would turn the TV off at night and tie a rubber band around the controller so I wouldn't get kicked for inactivity. It seemed toxic, but nobody cared about the contact missions at the time. Upon some self-reflection after saying that, I think I am the toxic player. But I never did it in important stuff like heists. 
mostly. It's not like I sought out this mission to grind and not do anything on purpose. It's just whenever you're the fourth person in the truck, you don't need to do anything. I've always been a guy who hates loading screens and cutscenes. My philosophy is if at any point in your video game, there is a point where the player can put down their controller, it's boring. A lot of games can't control how long their loading screens are, but a lot of them can control how long and boring their cutscenes are. So it's the game's fault. Can't be my fault, because it's the game's fault. I haven't really talked about the preps, because most of the preps are just you running around in free mode, picking up some vehicles you need for the setups. But for the Bogdan problem, one of the preps is grabbing the new vehicle, the Stromberg. The Stromberg is a James Bond style car that can turn into a submarine. You see where this is going. Even more so than the Avenger and jumping on top of it, I was so embarrassed to mess up the submarine recon mission. The point of this mission is to take the Stromberg underwater to blow up a ton of sea mines. Originally when I remembered dropping the one Deluxo in the water, and then I came across this mission while I was going back through the notes, and I'm like, oh, I misremembered. I actually dropped this car in the water and failed the mission. And then I looked back at both of them and realized no, I just messed both of them up in the exact same way. Multiple times, too. I took the Deluxo out of float mode and sank in the water. I took the Stromberg out of submarine mode and died instantly. I failed both of them in the same way. When you don't know how things work, you just hit every button. Occasionally, you hit the same button you hit to activate the thing. Not excusing it, just explaining why I think that. One time, we were fighting our way into the military base, and it was a long and stressful time, and then we finally got in there, and I stuck inside a tank, and I couldn't figure out how to shoot the tank, so I was hitting every button. And in the chaos of hitting all the buttons, I hit the Y button, thus jumping out of the vehicle and dying. I don't know if you knew this, but in GTA Online and GTA 5, most GTA games, the Y button is the exit vehicle button. Whenever there was a new player and we were all flying together, we would tell them that if they hit Y, they get a special bonus, and then we would see their body fall out of the air and splat on the ground. It's common knowledge, everyone does this joke. Is this even about a heist anymore? The actual Bogdan problem heist consists of two teams, and if you want to maximize the amount of money you make, two people. One person flies the Avenger to the submarine where the other person goes inside the submarine and does the whole mission. The person, the Avenger, doesn't have to do anything and just waits for the mission to be over. Guess which one I was. How and why is it that every time I'm in an air vehicle, it's the hardest it's ever been? But whenever I'm not, you don't, it's the easiest thing in the game. When it comes to the original heists, I had a lot more to say about the actual heists than the setups, but with the Doomsday heist, the heists part are actually Pretty boring. Fighting through the sub was the easiest thing I had to do in all the missions. And again, just because it's act two of an overarching story, it ends anticlimatically. And we find out that the tech mogul that was helping us out and that we were helping in turn, uh, turned out to be evil and his evil AI Clifford is going to take over the world. After this cutscene at the end of the heist, getting in this Avenger could go two ways. The Avenger could try and land in the water to pick you up and then immediately destroy itself. Or you could go on the beach where the Avenger can't really see you and then lands on top of you, crushing you, and you die. There's no in between. Then we get another cutscene where Lester hops in an invisible car and drives away. Let's let's wrap this up. The Doomsday Scenario. This is really where the repetitiveness starts to really set in. Set up one escort mission for Agent 14, fight a bunch of people on a dock, and then tanked up Invisiboy show up. The best way to defeat them is explosives, but again, the dock is made out of wood. One shot and the whole level goes up in flames. Down in flames? Up in flames? It catches on fire. Set up two. Escort mission, but this time for the ULP. After fighting off of these early henchmen, you get access to actually some pretty cool vehicles that you get to use in the mission. It's a shame it takes forever. And I don't mean it's hard. I just mean it's artificially stretched out. Yeah, it's fun to shoot helicopters out of the air with an explosive van, but once you hit like the hundredth helicopter, it ceases to be fun and starts being work? Maybe I'm just spoiled and my two second attention span can't handle how epic this game is. The next two setups are the exact same except it's a different vehicle. What a twist. Set up Barrage, you pick up the Barrage and fight people with it. Set up Kanjali, you pick up the Kanjali and fight people with it. Wow. Not only is it the exact same setup twice, but in the actual heist, you pick between which of these you want and they each fit about four people and it's easier to have all the crew together. So you'd wanna pick one of the vehicles. So in reality, in the heist, one of these vehicles you won't even use. If it was even, it would make a little more sense, but it makes even less sense because the barrage is nothing compared to the Kanjali. The Kanjali is a plasma tank with a giant plasma rifle. It shoots lasers. 
What does the barrage do? It's a van with a gun. The barrage is far worse than the... Why even bother stealing it? We don't need it. And the final setup is, again, the same thing, except you're stealing a giant plane with the Empire State Building wingspan. You know that one scene in Star Wars The Force Awakens where someone's using the gun under the Millennium Falcon and Rey needs to turn the ship off and flip it upside down so Finn can get the shot? That's this mission, except they're communicating with each other, and I'm getting random DMs from people I've never met in my life yelling at me. Like I said, the Doomsday scenario claims to have three new heists, but in reality, it's just three acts, and the Doomsday scenario, that's the only actual heist. And even then, it's not really. That being said, it does feel the most like a heist, at least. It's the longest of the three, and at least it has an actual ending. I couldn't pinpoint why this doesn't exactly feel like a heist, and then going back through it, I realized, you don't heist anything like our mission statement is to save the world and the money is just kind of secondary as a reward you're telling me there is a secret base buried under mount chiliad that no one knows about with a bunch of high-tech equipment all of which we have to bury under anyway so no one else can find it and we didn't at least steal like a stapler who's gonna miss it oh yeah this heist takes place in a secret facility inside mount chiliad which if you know a lot about gta online or gta in general this has been hinted at for a long time this is a big deal the prophecy of the jetpack has come full circle but we're getting ahead of ourselves. The heist starts with the squad driving to the pickup spot and picking either the barrage or the Kanjali, and they're gonna pick the Kanjali because it's way better. The next step is driving and shooting through a tunnel, and because you chose the Kanjali, it is not hard at all. You did choose it, right? Then we hit this little roadblock that you can't get past at all. It's not like the roadblock is super high or hard to get around. I just mean legitimately the game just shuts down your vehicle so it can't move anymore. If you're still on your first attempt and this has all happened in one run, you can remain in the Kanjali or, you know, barrage uh, for as long as you want and keep shooting stuff and then eventually get out. But if you die and spawn back here, you cannot get inside the vehicle. It's basically a giant brick. And as far as the spawn points go, this is it. This roadblock is your spawn point. You die in the heist, at any point in the heist, you come back to this roadblock. It was hard enough doing a heist finale with a crew together because the crew had different schedules, but doing it with randos, if you play GTA at any point, even on next gen console, it still does this. Loading into the loading screen takes like an absurd amount of time. So you're just sitting there on the edge of your seat wondering if this is the one where everyone bails and you have to start the whole heist over again with a new crew while also trying to find a new crew. And most of the time, the answer is yes. I get that this is a heist finale, so it must be super hard and very difficult for most people. But three deaths? I can't handle three deaths. I'm gonna leave even though I've been here for a long time and the other person has to start over. Yeah, I think actually I'm gonna leave in the middle of the heist. That sounds like a fun use of my time. And the ride to the roadblock isn't that hard, but the fact that every time people leave, you get, you have to wait for the loading screen to be booted out to free mode, find a new crew again, wait to load back into the mission, and then do the drive, get the Kajali, drive through the tunnel. None of that is hard, but doing it over and over, it will take your whole day. And then maybe people bail again. I'm at my limit. And I was really pissed at first because I knew this was likely only the beginning of the heist and was only going to get harder after that. So if I can't get people to stay in the early easy parts, what chance did I have at the later parts? We're talking about this telling a story progression, finally, Get past the roadblock. This door? You did not hack it. You never even opened it. I could hack it. Prove it. Open it. I can prove it anytime I like. No, Clifford! Voila. <laughs> Your AI is vain and insecure. I wonder where he gets that from. All these heists and missions and setups, at least for me, have been more or less the same thing over and over. Some of them have been a nice little turn. But most of them are, uh, go behind cover, shoot the guy, run away from the thing, drive the car, drive the bike, fly the helicopter, shoot the guy behind cover, over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And I was fully prepared for the doomsday scenario to be equally as derivative. But then, this part of the heist, you break into a little server room, and you need to hack a bunch of little computers with a bunch of little hack puzzles, and oh my god, finally! Finally a challenging heist where I can flex my expertise. Like I've shown throughout both the videos, I very rarely message people who are in a crew who I'm not really talking with, but when it came to these hacking computers, I messaged everyone and let them know, hey, I got this. I cracked my knuckles in real life and started doing all these rotating hack puzzles. God, I love these little puzzles. I'm in my element. I'm a little puzzle freak. And then after the hacking's over, you shoot some guys and use an orbital cannon. Who cares? But going through there, the heist reaches a fever pitch as Avon takes off in a jetpack and we have a very clear shot at him, but we decide not to shoot him for some reason. But I'm glad we didn't shoot him because the end of the heist, we all take off in different jetpacks and have an aerial jetpack fight with Avon, shooting him with missiles out of the air until he explodes and hits the ground. Never mind, I changed my mind. This heist rocks. The prophecy has been fulfilled. It's probably one of my favorite heists 
conceptually, you know, in an ideal world where I was playing with a bunch of people who wouldn't bail in the middle of it. The GTA 5 Doomsday Heist update gave me separation anxiety. Wow, what a 2017. I'm sure 2018 will be much better. Due to intervention from the YouTubers I was watching at the time, I decided to get my first Far Cry game, Far Cry 5. I've been having some trouble writing this just because I'm nervous about being able to top myself. Not nervous about topping other people, I gotta write that one down. I think of such mediocre jokes and I'm like, well, they're gonna love this one. I could cut that out. It doesn't add anything. I need to be realistic about why people are here. Are you here to relive the funny moments in a very nostalgic way to help you relive your time on Xbox? Or are you here to hear the complicated lore I set up for characters I made that no one else cares about? I just answered my question, but I'm gonna tell you about it anyway. Sunset Overdrive was one of the first games I played on the Xbox One, and I played it and enjoyed it for a long time. And then I got to this one pigeon level that I couldn't beat and then stopped playing and forgot everything about the game. But the character is what's important. If you'll direct your attention over to this guy with the pumpkin head and the black cape, this is where the lineage starts. And the lineage continues with the current reigning and I was gonna say defending, but I haven't defended it. It's been like, Nearly a decade. Whatever, the current champion of Hashtag Pydarb is the Pumpkin Priest. But where did he come from? The Pumpkin-Headed Freak from Sunset Overdrive must have a bunch of offspring somewhere. The villains of Far Cry 5, and by extension the people you need to take out one by one, are known as the Seed Family. There's Ethan Seed, Faith Seed, John Seed, Jacob Seed, Joseph Seed, and of course the forgotten member, Pumpkin Seed. They're family, sure, but did Pumpkin Seed manage to kill all of them and 100% the game with his two animal sidekicks? You know the answer. Yeah, of course he did. You're damn right. This may come as a surprise as how often I talked about not liking shooters before, but I got really into Far Cry. I think it's because of the way combat works in this game and platforming that yielded some pretty fucking rad clips. Look at this one where I shoot a plane down and then as the plane is crashing, I jump over the wing and not getting hit at all. Or when I jump off this building and stab this guy and melee kill him and finish the mission. Or when I jumped on top of this ATV, shot the guy driving the ATV and then kept riding the ATV away. I had way more fun in this than I did Far Fallout 4, and it's not even close. So if you're on the fence about this game and don't like shooters as much as I don't like them, just know that you can tame a bear named Cheeseburger or a bobcat named Peaches and have them fight for you, and it's awesome. And that's why I was hyped for the gator in Fallout 6. Regroup. Okay, well, they know where I am now. Don't wait for them to come in here. Go up. Ugh. Never listens to reason. That's why I love them. He's the best partner I could ask for. I was flying off the handle. Well, got her. I wish I could tell you that Far Cry 5 took up the majority of my game time, but that's not true. Took up all my game time. At least in the basement half of 2018. Wait a minute. What do you mean, basement half? In July of 2018, my family and I had moved out of my childhood home into... Well, if you're a fan, the house you have seen before. When we first got there, I was put in a very pink room and told that the basement is in terrible condition and that it was too dangerous for me to live down there. We'll see about that. So for the time being, this is the pink room era. 2018 was a pretty slow year for gaming, at least for me, but a pretty fucking rad year for games. I should mention, by the way, not just because of Far Cry, the reason I didn't play as much Xbox in the first half of 2018 is because I got Nintendo Switch the Christmas prior. And as far as memories go of 2018 that aren't at the new house, there is one big thing that happened summer 2018 right before I moved. <laughs> Hold off on that, put a pin in it. I promise I'll come back to it on a later day. And when I say I'll come back to it, I mean, look out for another long ass video this year. Hopefully, ah, oh, I shouldn't have said this year. So the majority of gaming for me in 2018 was not even playing game. It was getting hyped for Smash and also playing some games. Also, I had a job. I was at for the majority of 2018, so that definitely put a dent in my game time. That being said, there were still some cool releases. The tail end of 2018 had Red Dead Redemption 2 coming out in October, Pokemon Let's Go coming out in November, and Smash Brothers Ultimate coming out in December. Red Dead 2 didn't stand a chance. Red Dead Redemption 2! No, I wasn't implying that Let's Go is better than Red Dead 2. I know it's- I meant that it just took up more of my time because I'm a Pokemon fan and I just like Pokemon- People are gonna take it the wrong way, I know, I wasn't arguing. 
You know, maybe it is a better game. Oh, now we gotta get to a different argument. Red Dead Redemption 2 was fun when I played it, but I only played it for a month, so that doesn't really mean much. But that first month of being Arthur Morgan was crazy. I can't tell if I want to do an accent or not. I can't even tell if I am doing it. I don't know where else to put this in the video, so I'll put it in here right now. There was a promotion in GTA where if you found a certain chest, you go all around the map, like in a treasure hunt, you get a special gun, and the only thing cool about it is that you get a special little animation for when he flips it around. And if you have that gun, you could also carry it over to your Red Dead save. I think a game's quality is increased exponentially by how much of a badass you feel using the game's mechanics. Like being able to chain jumps together in Mario Odyssey is not only super fun and feels super crisp, but it makes you feel very cool. I talked about Far Cry and its game mechanics. I truly believe Red Dead Redemption was carried by its lasso. The lasso is the most fun part of the game. You can tie up folks, hang them behind a moving train, wait for them to hit into shit. You could tie them up and throw them in a campfire and watch them slowly die burning their head first. Maybe you didn't do that part. Right at the gate, right as the game starts, we're in a snowy area. This guy's trying to run away. Well, guess what? Bam! Nobody runs from Arthur. This guy's gonna run through the bottom of the barn. We better get him before he gets away. Bang! He's not getting away. His horse takes off with his body. Sneak around the corner. Guy doesn't notice me. Cartoon ass moment. Just fight a guy and tackle him into a pig trowel. Baller moment. Cowboys say baller. <laughs> Is the rest of this video just gonna be me showing Xbox clips that I think are cool? No, but it would have been funny if I said yes. The point I'm reaching is while the game isn't super fun for a long time, those mechanics and that short form of playing it was so much fun. A new Pokemon comes out the next month and I'm completely whipped by the franchise, but it's another Kanto game. I know what to expect. I'll run through it fairly quickly. But they must have known people are going to lose interest around this time because November 7th is when Red Dead Redemption 2 Online Open Beta was open to the public. That is what that means. <laughs> Imagine they would kill us in broad daylight, but you never know. I had the game and my buddy Kyle had the game. You may know him and we were very eager to play together, but we weren't dumb. Okay, I had already planned the whole day Smash Ultimate came out around that day. I was like, oh, we're gonna play this all day. This is what we're gonna do for the rest of our lives, I guess. So we knew that we had a very short amount of time to play this game. Doing the math and looking at the dates, we had basically 11 days to play Red Dead Redemption 2 online and experience it to its fullest. And you know what? That we did. I think we were in the perfect point where if we played it for too long, we would have gotten bored. Where where we left off, there wasn't a lot of content at launch. There was some pretty basic online stuff. Of course, it was an open beta, and I'm sure they've added stuff since. But at that time, we left at the perfect time because it was leaving us wanting more. But it's not like we were meandering. We managed to do everything and leave before it got boring love and loss. This hillbilly character I created is just a normal man with a long white beard that wears red, lives in the snow. He is not Santa Claus, despite what the media may tell you. His two horses, this giant white angelic creature, Coco. And this dinky little shit is Pegasus. Pegasus has pink hair, but you can't tell because he's constantly dirty. Is a real mess. He was born in the snowy mountains of wherever this game is set. Texas, I think. So that's where he's most at home. Actually, can you watch this clip for me real quick? I'll be right back. It'll be real quick. Alright, thanks for watching him. Then Kyle got in on this, and we got in on some crazy cowboy shit. Gather around the campfire, children, as I shall regale you of stories of the countryside. Have you heard the story of the duplicating lap-sitting man and the underground horses? Of course you have. Those aren't that scary. Have you heard the legend of the Headless Horseman? The Headless Horseman wanders the land looking for a victim to trick into shooting him over and over and taking way too long to realize the hits weren't registering and then taking even longer to realize this character doesn't have a head. Venturing through the Wild West all by your lonesome is dangerous. One day you'll just be riding along on your horse, tie this one guy up and then decide to untie him and he'll immediately go for your throat with a knife. That's why you need a friend around to come in and save your life with a shot. I was gonna say warning shot, but no, he killed him. That was the day, children, that cowboy- My hair looks stupid. That was the day that cowboy Kyle saved my life. And that's it for Red Dead, really. Robbing trains and tying people up and putting them in fires was really the majority of the fun we had there. And not nearly as fun as smashing your bros. At the end of the year, I had made up my mind and no one was gonna stop me. I packed up all my stuff and moved out of the pink room and moved into the basement.
Do I really need to explain the boy's basement? Even if you're new, it's iconic by this point. Because of Switch Online and most of my close friends were people I went to school with now, there wasn't a lot of Xbox play. Going through old saves, I think maybe the bestest world was made by us around this time, because I remember being in the basement and we called ourselves the bestest boys, and then shortened it to the boys, you know the whole story. I remember being in a giant sandcastle, I remember maybe there was a sky castle in it, but really, who can remember? If there was a sky castle, I can't imagine anyone would remember it or hold a grudge about it this many years later. I did link back up with Logan around this time, and we went back to the annual Christmas Minecraft world. We rolled around in some snow in Los Santos. There was a casino update at this time and a heist alongside it, but I don't know anyone that played it. I did play it, but it took... A long time. Not that it was hard. I just like intermittently played it over a couple years. So I think I only finished it right before I moved again. By 2019, not only had I not talked to members of the group in a long time, but I had graduated. So the boys and the stinky oranges, I wasn't really going to see anymore or talk to them as much. I guess I'll hang out with the boys through the YouTube channel. That's where the whole point was. But at some point, they all started moving away and doing their own things. And again, the first time in a while... I was alone. The likelihood of everyone being together to play online games together were very low. Emphasis on were. I don't know if you guys know this, you may be way too young, it was two years ago. Um, but early 2020, some people started to get a little bit sick. I, it feels like I'm negating it. I'm not. It's a real thing. I just think it's, I'm being silly. For a year, I was preparing to be on my own and be able to make stuff by myself. And of course, in a roundabout way, that's what I'm doing now. But I had to mentally prepare to not be able to play with any of my online friends. And then out of nowhere, luckily for me, a pandemic happened. I didn't cause it though. All those people in the comments saying I caused the pandemic, you need more proof than those pages, all right? Double your document. I know it's already 10 pages, but I didn't start the pandemic. Not that the pandemic as a whole was a good thing because objectively, looking at numbers, it was not. And even for us, it wasn't good. I know always focusing on us. Why is this pandemic's about us? I'm spiraling. Everyone was really bummed until one day our buddy Kyle texted a couple of the boys and said, hey, new Call of Duty Battle Royale came out. Do you want to play it? Call of Duty Warzone. There's a lot of overarching themes running throughout this story, and one of my favorites is that I constantly play Call of Duty games solely so I can hang out with my friends who I enjoy hanging out with and then making them instantly regret it. I can't say I enjoyed playing Warzone because it wasn't fun, but I enjoyed playing with my friends. And I lived with Kyle since then, you know, after that, and I would occasionally walk past his desk while he's playing it and just hear some of the worst stuff, so I'm glad we got out before the community well, became the Call of Duty community, you know how it is. I know deep down, realistically, it was not because of me, but in the first game I joined them, they had been playing for a while, and I finally jumped in their squad, is when they got their first dub, it was the first game I was in. I know it wasn't because of me, but God, is it funny to claim that I helped them. I know it's not true, but I, I will hold it over them for the rest of my life. God, it's so fucking funny. A month later, for our good friend and current boy Riley's birthday, we decided to make a new Minecraft world and all play together. It was primarily a boy's world, but I did bring in Logan to the server from time to time. We were all dicking around and not accomplishing much in the world, and then the first night Logan was on, when he joined the world, he went and beat the Ender Dragon by himself. None of us knew about this until the next day he, we talked about the end and he's like, oh yeah, I already beat it. What do you mean you already beat it? We all worked together to make a giant sand castle that everyone could live in and in the end, nobody lived in it. As far as the most amount of building progress goes, I know Logan already did the most actual progress. It was a tie between Riley, Logan, and me. Riley took over a village and built a self-sustaining mansion of his own and also fixed the entire village's economy from the ground up. Logan made a floating mausoleum in the sky. I don't think it is actually a mausoleum. I just think that's a fancy word and I don't know how else to describe a coliseum maybe, but it's not even that. It's pillars. And I converted this village into my own with a giant ass farm and another platform that's man-made, but it doesn't look like it. Also, tons of animals, like way too many, way too many animals to name. But would you like to meet him? See a bunch of cats behind me. We got Antonio Banderas, Magical Mr. Mistopheles, Jasper, Salem, Simba, Garf, Gordon, Jasper, Percy, Waffle, Bob 1, Bob 2, Bob 3, Bob 4, Bob 5. I ran out of names, I guess. And two cats based on my real cats when I made them, Crispin and... Oliver. Not to bum everyone out. I don't actually think this is a sad thing. I think it's actually pretty cool. But 
you know, my cat, Oliver, at the time, I was like, I didn't think much of it. I'm like, yeah, you know, he's my cat and I love him. I'll put him in the games. Why not? So I have, I haven't told, I told it on stream. I haven't told it in a video. When I first played through Pokemon Fire Red, I named Growlithe Oliver. And I was like 10 at the time and he was still like a baby kitten. And then he grew up into an Arcanine. So now I have this Arcanine I have still transferred up through the games named Oliver. And I have this cat in this world named Oliver. And then... Earlier this year, Oliver passed away, and again, I don't think it's a bummer. I think it's a cool thing that he's, like, immortalized in these games. That being said, this is the first world we made into a realm, so it's open. So if you wanted to be really fucked up, you could go into the world and kill the Oliver cat. Not like I don't have it coming, but... Coco makes another appearance. I have another horse named 1974 in archaeology because I hit random on Wikipedia and named it after whatever the first article was. I was really into naming horses abstract things around this time, and I still kind of am. I never got over that phase. So my main horse, aside from archaeology, was named Bertram from Jesse. Not just Bertram, and that's the reference. His full name was those three words, Bertram from Jesse. And everyone on the realm knew the horse. They would see him while I was driving by everyone because the village I lived in was pretty far. I wanted to traverse maps. But then one night I was playing by myself because, you know, it was my world, but it's also a realm. But I was by myself and I was... I guess he fell in lava or something, and I was like, oh no, the beloved horse that's a funny name is dead. So I opened up my phone and started texting Logan, and I was about to send. And I looked down at my phone at what I typed, and I typed out the words... Bertram from Jesse just died. And I realized I have just duped myself. Because if I got a text that said Bertram from Jesse just died, even if I knew there was a horse named that, I would assume, oh no, the actor's dead. Because that's what Bertram from Jesse means. So we could call it the boys meet world because that's what it's titled on the Xbox. Or we could call it the realm world because out of all the survival worlds, this is the first one I've made into a realm. And I think it's still running actually. Those are some recurring payments that are going to burn a hole later in my life. And because I wanted to pad out the world and also bridge the gaps a little bit, of course I had the boys and Logan, but I sent some invites over to some of the stinky oranges and texted them because I haven't talked to them in a while. And they're like, yeah, I'll play online. So a bunch of them have structures built in this realm too that again i have not found i'd love to give you a tour of this realm but it's bigger than any world we've ever made and also i think it kind of diminishes some of the mystery but reality aside from all those we call it the village world much like the town world the mountain world and the island world the common theme is most people that live in this world have taken over different villages also as far as new updates go this was a little bit after the pillager update so that caused a whole ruckus. There was a war. I keep mentioning longtime fans of the channel, and I know that I'm going in a completely different direction. It's just like really deep cut references. I don't even like when people watch the old videos because I'm a little embarrassed about a lot of them. But if you did watch the Minecraft creepypasta video, this is the world we read them in. So in the new pandemic era, we started playing Call of Duty Warzone and then transitioned into playing a new Minecraft world. Later in the year, we got really into Fall Guys when that came out. We got super hooked. If you know Fall Guys today, then you know it was bought out by Epic, so it could be sold on the Epic Store, because the Epic Store, I don't actually know how long it's existed, but its only thing for a while was Fortnite, and then they decided, hey, we're gonna compete with Steam, we need to boost our sales a little bit. For the same reason in 2022, I don't remember how frequently it happened, but always at any time there was some free game being given away on Epic. All you had to do was make an Epic account and have the Epic Games launcher, and you can get a free game, I'm pretty sure it was like every couple weeks which is a lot of free games most of them were garbage but occasionally on may of 2020 for about a week gta 5 was free to get on the epic store and die i told you the ink company would get its second wind i just needed enough people to join i got the pc version of the game and the boys got the pc version of the game and you would think i would just transfer my save over but you can't do that anymore there was a small period of time where you could but the amount of hackers and cheaters on the pc version were immense so they thought what if we didn't let them do things and by them i don't mean the people hacking i mean you know me i know it will realistically never happen but when people ask me what's something i like oh i could most want in gaming i have most of the stuff i want the one thing i could ever ask for right now is rockstar implementing cross-platform with gta online i could play fall guys with anyone i could play minecraft with anyone but i can't play gta with any of my friend groups because there's hackers on pc that they don't want to be enabled on console just prevent them from hacking it's your game you You've done it before. You did it on console. 
Just do, I know it's not the same thing, but it can't be that. This is your game. You know what's insane? The reason I got this Xbox in the first place is because I didn't want my save to be stranded so I could immediately transfer my GTA save to Series X. And now because I transferred, I can't even play online with people on the Xbox One. GTA 5 is the thing that brought the group together and I can't play it with any of them. I have to play with Series X gamers. Do you know how many people own a Series X? Legitimately, I'm asking because I need people to play with now. Because I was frightened that Rockstar would delete the save that I put time and money, you saw the money, into, I got startled and immediately transferred my save, and now I can't even play the game with the group. The game that brought the group together, I gotta play it by myself. Sorry, it's just... It's just so stupid. That's my pipe dream if they port GTA 5 to the Switch. I will never need any other console. It will be my favorite one. All my favorite games will be on that little thing. And to negate the whole argument I just had, it was annoying to have to start over, but it was honestly kind of fun to start from scratch again. I did immediately save up for the Christmas Insurgent again. It was legitimately my first purchase. It's the best investment. But starting from scratch, the Ink Company became more of a cult than an actual organization where all the members had to wear black silk pajamas, blue surgical gloves, and gorilla masks. Like literal gorilla, not the th one you're thinking of. Knock it off. And we gave ourselves a challenge. We were tasked to convert as many people as possible. Someone was only converted if they joined the crew and then donned the full attire. While I just complain about the immense amount of hackers on GTA on PC, and I normally prefer playing everything on console, I will say the one thing PC version has over all the console versions is the type chat. I mentioned last time that when I played with randos, I didn't ever want to get in a call or talk with people that I didn't know, but typing, and now that I'm an adult man, the most fun I had was just talking with random people and converting them to a cult that doesn't actually exist. I've always been told I'd make a really good cult leader. My proudest moment in any video game, like proudest gaming moment legitimately ever, is when we and the boys were playing in a server and we were trying to do something and there was somebody doing the orbital cannon glitch thing to bomb everyone on the server and they were just like, oh man, let's just leave, let's just go try and find another server. But I was like, no. Let me talk to this guy. So I started talking him down, and then I talked him away from the- I was like a hostage negotiator. I talked him away from the cannon. I used the power of my words to get better at a video game. And I told him, hey, you could play along with me and my friends. I convinced him that we were all nice people. And then he went over to go greet my two boys, and they killed him. Because you don't bomb Inky, okay? And survive. Yeah, we kept playing up to the Cayo Perico heist, which I have tried both on PC and on console with a bunch of different groups, and I have still, to this day, yet to finish it. I only bring it up because in the update it gives you a submarine, and most of the time playing PC around this time when the whole hostage negotiation happened, we were just fucking around with the submarine to see what it could do. If you check the Inky crew now, and I think you can because it's a public crew, you will see a bunch of people I don't know who are just randos I converted off the street, and if you want to join, you know the attire. Till next time, Inky. It'll make a comeback. And that's it. As far as non-documented stuff goes, some stuff after that was on the channel or on stream. You may have seen it, you may have not. It's not memories though, it just happened. But as far as my story on the Xbox One goes, I've moved on. What? The Where am I? Oh my God, Terraria Tree, Kyle Ren, a pumpkin seed. Stalking, stalking, gravy green hood, Mr. E, Pegasus. Bertram from Jesse, pumpkin priest, orangutan. Tropical, caveman, Jim, Tarork. You made a lot of these characters are wrestling guys. What's going on here? You are in great danger. I thought you were dead. I have moved on, but you, my son, are closer to death than I. I don't, what does that mean? It means you're running out of air. <sighs> right. Producers are gonna take my memories away. That was the deal. What a fair deal. You give my memories back, give me that little taste of freedom. You use my memories for content to milk me for all my memories I have, my childhood. Not just the happy memories, but the bad ones. I'm gonna get them back. Not because I'm fighting for them back, not because I'm going to war, but because you guys know when I talk about my memories, we do the best. So just know. And when I get all my memories back, because it will be all of them, I'm not just going to remember my childhood or the good moments. I'm going to remember the bad ones. I'm going to remember this. I'm going to remember what you did to me. And I'm going to make you regret it. Take them. I don't care anymore. Fine, just take them away. 
the weird, I can't tell if I don't remember things anymore because you never, like, how do you know if you can't remember things? I feel the same, though. Is that water? Where's water coming from? <laughs> Thank you.